meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and I'll call this meeting to order. First thing I'd like to do is announce that the agenda has um, changed. Um, in order for the um, RRMC uh, budget discussion to occur, we have to have a court reporter, and so um, that is going to occur at two o'clock. So um, we're going to start with Clover Health, and if that goes quickly, we'll move to guidance, but we'll break in the middle of guidance if we start it, and then go to RRMC at two, and then go back to finish guidance after that. So a little bit confusing, but uh, um, we'll get through. So with that, uh, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to announce some ongoing special public comment periods. Uh, first, to remind folks that uh, on March 2nd, the board discussed the, the certificate of need dollar thresholds and the board's authority to adjust them. So we do have an ongoing open public comment period for that item. And we will be hearing next week from our general counsel, Mike Barber, on um, that topic. Um, the second public comment period is regarding the FY23 hospital budget guidance. Um, today, if we if we do not vote on the FY23 hospital budget guidance, we will extend the public comment to Monday, March 28th. Um, the public comment period ended this Monday, and as a reminder, the board takes public comment. 365 days a year, but we did um, close that period in order to be considered for the board if there was a vote today. Um, the third item is that we are also um, taking public comment regarding the University of Vermont Medical Center's mid-year budget adjustment request, and um, that information is located on our website on their mid-year request. I will also note that next week uh, we we have scheduled UVMMC to come in to go over their mid-year uh, rate request with the board. And then last but certainly not least, the board is holding an open public comment period on a potential next agreement with our partners at CMMI. Uh, any of the comments that are submitted, we share with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next model. And that is all I have for today. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday 316 and Thursday 317. Is there a motion? So moved. I'll move a poop. We got to coordinate, Tom. I'll second. So Tom has moved to approve the minutes of Wednesday 316 and Thursday 317 without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion passed unanimously. So next we're going to the discussion on the Clover Health budget, and I'm gonna turn it over to Marissa and Russ. So whenever you're ready, take it away. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Can you hear me? We can. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let me make this uh, as big as I can for everybody. There it is. All right, thank you. Again, my name is Marissa Melamed. I am Associate Director for Health Systems Policy. I'm going to walk through the slides uh, leading up to a potential vote on the review of Clover Health Partners FY22 budget. I'm joined by Russ McCracken from our legal team, 
um, and he's available to help me with questions or any uh, you know, legal matters, um, particularly around uh, any motions that you might like to make for the for the vote. So to begin, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board received two comments from the public uh, since we presented to you last week, uh, as well as comment from Clover Health Partners. The comments are posted on the Green Mountain website at the link on the screen if in case uh, anyone wants to take a look at those. Uh, the public comments generally uh, related to Clover's ability to operate in the state of Vermont, uh, concerns about Clover being a for-profit publicly traded company and added administrative costs, concerns the model provides incentive for inappropriate utilization through delay or denial of care, um, or upcoding or gaming of the system and concerns about patient notification and protections. So in response to the public comment and to frame the board's decision today, we want to remind you of a couple of elements of the review framework that we went through last week. Uh, this framework is how we developed our recommendations and we've made some adjustments to the recommendations based on the comment uh, and discussion within the last week. So the first point here is a reminder about the board's authority, which Russ presented to you last week. Uh, Clover Health Partners is not subject to certification because they do not receive payments from Medicaid or commercial payers. So the question of you know, certifying them to operate in the state of Vermont is not uh, on the table because they're not subject to that uh, part of the statute. Uh, under 18 VSA 9382B2 and Rule 5.405, um, the Green Mountain Care Board shall review and approve or modify an ACO's budget. So the question before you today is um, a, approval or modification of, of the budget. Um, and, you know, we recognize that this um, feels a bit uh, different because there's a not it's a multi-state company and there's not a lot of Vermont specific information around the budget but um, we felt like we put a review together uh, based on the information available the boards um, and the board's authority to to regulate a company uh, such as this other uh, key points that we went over last week that are, are pertinent to some of the comments are around uh, patient impact uh, and general concerns uh, regarding inappropriate coding or, or stinting on care. Um, you know, like like the comments we read, uh, the Green Mountain Current Board staff um, and board members I know have have followed the literature um, on on the, these um, new Medicare models um, and you know take those concerns uh, seriously. And uh, finally, you know, resulted in our recommendations for, for reporting and monitoring. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the slides, just as a reminder to address those issues that came up in the comments. Um, so this is the slide that we presented around how the direct contracting model impacts Medicare beneficiaries costs and care. Uh, so again, beneficiaries that are aligned to a direct contracting entity are still in traditional Medicare. So they retain their uh, traditional Medicare uh, rights, including access to the entire traditional Medicare network, um, and it does not affect out-of-pocket costs and premiums um, or affect their use of supplemental insurance, um, except in the case that um, there may be some benefit to help with cost sharing, um, as um, which is a benefit enhancement that the direct contracting can, can elect to participate in. The entity. Uh, the, the next bullet there is around uh, direct contracting entity attributed beneficiary rights uh, that are included in the direct contracting entity participation agreement. These include beneficiary notifications, uh, their freedom of choice, and their right to opt out of data sharing. Um, and again, this is similar to the agreements in the other uh, ACO arrangements that we review, and we do have copies of a copy of that notification uh, that we have examined and are included as part of the, the materials submitted by Clover. Um, and again, they may have access to some um, additional benefits through the program, uh, including coordinated care and um, 
they can continue to go outside the DC network and their access to some benefit enhancements. Again, we went over these things last week, um, but we wanted to remind people of those. Um, in addition, there's been uh, quite a bit of discussion around the transition of the direct contracting model to the new ACL REACH model. Um, and this uh, announcement was made, like we said last week, uh, basically shortly before we got this presentation together, but it did impact our review and recommendations. Um, the, the administration has taken a, a look at the direct contracting arrangement and made some changes based on uh, stakeholder feedback, um, you know, provider and, and, and patient advocate feedback, as well as uh, concerns from members of Congress around uh, the, you know, the impacts um, or potential uh, adverse incentives of the model. And they have made some changes which will be implemented uh, as of January 1, 2023. So this budget review and recommendations that we're looking at is is only for for the remain for this year for the remainder of this year um, and we will take a look at uh, implications in the new model um, if uh, clover can you know decides to continue to participate in the in the new model as as they have indicated they intend to um, and again the changes in the ACR reach model um, are around governance um, the addition of a health equity component uh, changes to the to the benchmarking, um, which is which is intended to address some of that um, uh, up, you know potential upcoding um, or other um, inappropriate risk score gains or other potential gaming of the system, which is you know which people are familiar with from the literature. And um, there's also additional monitoring and compliance requirements uh, in ACR Reach. Um, I added this slide specifically to talk about the risk adjustment changes uh, in ACL reach, which include a, a coding intensity factor that limits risk score growth across the entire model. Uh, the coding intensity factor applies to all DCEs to limit risk score growth to the average prior to the start of the model. Um, there's also changes to the risk score growth cap, which limits a DCE's risk score growth to plus or minus 3% over a two year period and the direct contracting entity specific caps on overcoding ensure DCEs are coding appropriately and limit gaming. Um, so REACH model adopts a static reference year population for the remainder of the model performance year. Um, and it caps the REACH ACO's risk score growth relative to the entity's demographic risk score growth. Um, so this, uh, I wanted to, to make clear we, um, you know, these are changes that Medicare has put in place. There were questions around this as we were reviewing the um, the proposal and if we, or the application, and um, if we wanted to impose, you know, Vermont-specific monitoring um, on this issue, I, issue I, I think we could consider that. Um, we did not include a staff recommendation around it um, because we um, felt that, um, uh, you know, we wouldn't have the ability to monitor this specifically to Vermont any better than um, Medicare is current, you know, currently proposes. Um, so we want to take a look at, um, you know, this in the future, but I want to make clear that, um, you know, there, there have been steps taken by Medicare to further uh, address this, this concern in the model. So this slide just summarizes sort of the key points that frame the, our recommendations uh, as, as, as we finalize them for today. Um, the payer program arrangements are set by Medicare in the participation agreement. So again, we don't have the ability to uh, change or impact that. There's, you know, we have uh, access to that agreement um, and we've looked at it against, you know, during our review against criteria, um, but those are set um, set by Medicare and they oversee um, and audit their agreements. Um, like I said, that participation agreement was, was reported to Green Mountain Care Board and is available on our website. Um, there are new requirements in the ACR REACH model around governance, health equity, and additional monitoring and compliance. So we felt that these uh, were a good step in addressing some of our concerns, and at least for the size and scope 
currently um, did, you know, did not feel like we needed to do anything additional um, here. Those, those seemed like good steps toward some of the concerns raised uh, with the previous model. Um, and finally, um, I, to address uh, concerns about any potential legal action and make sure that um, that was being clearly reported uh, to us so we can we can monitor that activity. Um, Clover Health is required to regularly regularly report on any material pending legal actions taken against the ACO or its affiliates or against any members of the ACO's executive leadership team or board of directors related to their duties and any such actions known to be contemplated by government authorities. They're already required to report this um, and we're asking them to report it directly to uh, the board as well. So that brings us to the final recommendations which have been updated uh, slightly since last week. I think mostly for specificity. So I'm gonna go through that. There also has been some back and forth um, just even up to several minutes before this meeting. So I'm going to try to incorporate um, where I think um, we've landed here. And Russ, you can let me know if you think um, we need to change uh, the way this is worded based on my understanding um, or if, if the wording is good here. Um, and, but I'll explain by going through it. So the, the final recommendations from staff are to approve uh, Clover Health Partners FY22 budget as submit, submitted subject to the following conditions. The red here are changes from last week. Um, so regarding shared savings, we are asking Clover Health to provide to Green Mountain Care Board its shared savings segmented for Vermont. Uh, we wanted to clarify that we'd like this by provider category, so that is participant and preferred. Um, and then we added in a timing component since we uh, understand the timing here to be that Clover, um, that the preliminary shared savings results will be available um, for 2021 will be available in July 22. Um, and final results for 21 and 22 will be available in July 2023. Um, and or in each case within 14 days after CMS publicly releases the results. So this first recommendation is one that we had a little back and forth on because we um, originally, you will see in the comments from Clover's uh, representation, David Alt, that they uh, requested that we that we uh, clarify this recommendation um, because CMS only reports shared savings on an aggregate DCE basis, which we understood um, as well. Um, and we, we would like to see it broken out by Vermont. Um, the way that they can do that is to provide the aggregate shared savings uh, or losses divided by the total number of uh, Clover aligned beneficiaries and then multiplied by the total number of Clover aligned beneficiaries affiliated with Ver Vermont participant providers. What that would give us is a proportion of shared savings or losses that is attributed to Vermont. Um, but I do not, I don't think that necessarily tells us the amount of shared savings that is paid to, to, to those providers. If the, that amount, to my understanding, is subject to provider uh, agreements, and I don't know if there's adjustments, if it's a strict proportion or if it's adjustments. Um, so I want to clarify that what um, I mean here as staff or what the staff intention is, um, is to get that calculation of the proportion um, that is attributed to Vermont providers, um, but we would also like to know the, the actual amount um, that is paid out to Vermont providers uh, for the performance year. Uh, we can all, I'll go through all of these and then we can see if there are questions. Uh, I think that's the one that, that maybe is a little bit confusing. Uh, the second one is that Clover Health provides to Green Mountain Care Board its quality reported segmented for Vermont if possible, with appropriate restrictions to protect, protect patient confidentiality. Um, and again, we added the same language here about the timing of the reporting. Uh, we put back in the, uh, if, if possible, um, to indicate that we would like to see Vermont specific quality reporting. Um, we recognize two things. One, um, there, it's a small, uh, it's a, it's a, there's a small numbers 
problem. Um, that's why we added with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality. Um, uh, it's only one participant provider. Um, the other reasons that we added uh, this is that uh, with our other ACO programs, we have quality uh, results reported by payer program only. Um, we do have some measures that end up getting broken out uh, at an HSA level, but I don't think that uh, Clover sort of at the size that that um, necessarily makes sense. Um, so uh, can discuss uh, how we feel about uh, the way we change this, but that is where we landed after um, thinking about this a little bit more, at least for this year. Um, that our intention is we would like to see Vermont-specific quality reporting, um, but are not confident that that's going to be available for 22. Uh, the third one is just had some clarification uh, that is to collect the audited financials for Clover Health that include Clover Health Partners balance sheet and statement of operations contributions and submit a standalone audit for Clover Health in each case to the extent required by CMS or if filed or required to be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, so we are not intending um, for Clover to create a, a new audit that they don't already create, but we would like to see uh, Clover Health audit um, information and audit notes um, specific to the direct contracting entity to the extent that that is uh, available um, required by their CMS agreement and, and filed with the SEC. Um, and then the final recommendation didn't change, so I don't think I need to read that again. So that uh, we can probably pause here for questions. I'll just show the final slide just so people know where we're at. Um, for today, um, uh, once I conclude my remarks, it would go to board questions and any discussion, uh, public comment, and then um, any motions or, or potential vote. Um, and uh, once a vote takes place, uh, we will draft a budget order um, outlining the, the, the process and the final, um, any final conditions. Um, and then we are looking ahead to developing our Medicare only uh, ACO guidance for FY23, which will be developed in the spring. Um, so with that, uh, that's the end of my remarks and I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we'll start with board questions and comments. Any member of the board have questions or comments? I have a question related to the audit. Um, I, I, if they, so my question is, um, Marissa, if you could actually go back to the recommendations, that would be helpful. Um, I can. My question, my question is, so it seems to me what you're trying to do is say, if CMS or the SEC require an audit of Clover Health Partners, we'd like to get it. Why wouldn't we want to get it if they just happen to choose to do it uh, voluntarily? I, I understand you're you're not proposing that we require that they do an audit that they wouldn't otherwise do, but and maybe it's kind of a moot point because they wouldn't choose to do that. But that's my question. Yeah, I think I can answer that, and then I'll let Russ jump in if I don't have it quite right. But my understanding is that um, anything that is publicly reported also has to be publicly reported to the SEC. So um, we are going with, um, you know, information that there's already, that they're already required to submit to the SEC, either by CMS or other requirements. Is that right, Russ? Yeah, I, we could certainly say, or if, or if that audit is otherwise available, um, it was my, um, based on some back and forth with uh, Clover and their responses to our questions, we sort of understood that they weren't going to do it unless they were actually required to do it by by CMS or or um, you know some public company auditing standard required them to do it. Um, okay. But I I think I don't you know there's certainly no uh, downside for us to, to broaden this and say. That they have to provide it if it's otherwise available too. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I think that's my only question. Thanks, Robin. Other board members? I have a question on the uh, quality reporting. Um, it, um, I, I did, uh, you know, I, I did go and, and kind of track down a, you know, the Appendix D, which is, are the metrics for quality reporting um, in their uh, relationship with CMS. And I'm, I've just, uh, so let me just read them off quickly. The three key ones um, that they are one all cause unplanned admit, admit ad, admissions for patients with multiple chronic conditions. Second is days at home for high needs population DCE. And the third is timely follow up after acute exacer exacerbations of chronic conditions for standard DCE or new entrant DCE. And I, I guess when I read that, I said, what are they after here? If these are the metrics that are going to define settlement amounts, et cetera, et cetera, um, it seems to me that they're using the metrics that, that basically uh, relate to people um, accessing high end services. Um, and so if you're um, days at home, uh, if you have more days at home, it means that you don't have days um, at a more acute care setting. Or if you have all cause unplanned admissions for patients with multiple chronic conditions, if those are going down, that's a good thing. Um, and I, I, it would be a good thing, but I, I'm not quite sure what it tells us about the health quality of health of the beneficiaries. And I'm just wondering if there, if you have any thoughts about that, Marisha. I don't think it would be a question for me to answer uh, around how those quality measures are set. Uh, I would, it, if Dave wants to answer that, I would let him, I also would understand if it, if not, um, um, but we weren't in a position of, uh, you know, telling them what quality measures or not um, would be included. This is what is included in the uh, agreement, is my understanding. Yeah, and this, yeah, is, this is Dave. Dave. Um, um, in terms, in of, terms the of the quality measures, measures and I'm sorry, I'm if, sorry there's if there's feedback. feedback. Let's see if, I, see if I can fix that. Is that any that better? might need yes. to mute. Okay. Um, I think this, you can't hear me okay now. We can. Maybe, yes. okay, Are you on great. your phone as awesome. well as the computer, Dave? I am. I just muted my computer. I think I was causing okay, the problem. And hopefully, I have fixed it now, Jeremy. <laughs> my apologies for that. I every time I think I have the technology figured out, I do something else wrong with it. So um, <laughs> join the club. Uh, but I, <laughs> Um, with respect to the quality measures, you know, this is something that obviously is set by the Innovation Center and that they um, adapt, you know, over time um, to try to make sure that the program is improving the quality of care. And they've had larger measure sets and more narrow measure sets. And where they've landed, my understanding of where they've landed with these measures is, as you said, they have the you know the hospital readmission measures and some of the other uh, claims measures that they're looking at, and that sort of gives the um, sort of that clinical experience of the patients that you know are are there patients that are being admitted and readmitted and readmitted, showing that their care is not being controlled and um, and that they're not having good care coordination. But then it's also balanced by the new addition of the caps measures, which are um, which are actually a survey not conducted by the ACO or the DCE, but um, it's a CAP survey which gives a consumer viewpoint. So this actually patients that are talking about the um, about their experience and the provider interaction experience, and that's a quarter. So it's one of the four components that are going to com comprise the quality score. So what they try to do is sort of part of their recentering around the patient in addition to the traditional clinical measures. 
Um, and so th that, that's what they've done. Um, I will say that, you know, it is something that can evolve over time within a model. Um, you may have noticed it with the, the Vermont model, um, but it's something that I would expect every two years or so, the Innovation Center very may well update to make sure they're capturing what they think is important to be gauging um, patient health. And I'll say, you know, another component of that that they are capturing is, is the health equity piece that they want to make sure that there is increased um, penetration to underserved communities to those that traditionally were not have not had uh, access to high quality care. So I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, that, that's what I can offer. It is helpful. Um, it, all of it's helpful. Um, a couple of other things I had. Um, it just going back to the um, the quality reports, the preliminary quality results for 2021. Uh, those will be available July of 2022, but it's my understanding that there won't be any Vermontness to that at all because there is no uh, DC uh, uh, direct contracting entity in Vermont in 2021. So these would be, and I think it's for three quarters of a year is, is the basis for the data in terms of those 68,000 plus members in DCEs um, uh, in 2021. So is that a fair assumption given our, uh, or a fair understanding of our discussion at, at our last meeting about that? I think I can clarify for you a little bit. So Clover was operating in Vermont in 2021, starting in April as all direct contracting entities the, the model that didn't start until april 21 so it is a shortened year um, and my understanding is that uh clover will um be be given their qual you know th they will have quality results available for 21 um on a preliminary basis um in july and now i i don't know um ne necessarily the reasoning why the that CMS has extended the first year results to for 19 months. Again, maybe Dave knows the answer to that. Um, but they there will be quality results for 21. We can we could we can well our recommendation asks for the preliminary results, but the final results you know that are used to you know to do the final performance um, it are you know are not going to be available until July 23 for both years. Right. Which are the only I, mean, I, the model. I, under, I understand there will be quality results for 2021, but because in 2021 there is no uh, direct contracting entity in Vermont, Vermont will, will not be mm -hmm. part of that. No, mix they, they were operating in Vermont in 21. Clover was operating in Vermont from April through the end of 21. Hmm. A, as a, di a direct contracting entity or as a Yes. Thank you. A um, couple of other things. Um, do you do you have any when when you uh, engage in the ACO re reach program? Maybe this is looking too far ahead, but I worry that Vermont's small, and that uh, in terms of the board of directors. Uh, you know, uh, I think it looks like a good thing here nationally that they're increasing the uh, basis for uh, board members to be 75% comprised 75% of the board as opposed to 25% now. Um, and do, do you have any idea how many board members there might be to uh, Clover partnership um, relative to the AC Re reach program? Um, again, Dave can speak to this if he'd like. I think, I can't remember off the top of my head because I don't have it. I think there's maybe 15 uh, currently. Um, and, you know, the, the makeup will have to be adjusted. Uh, right now, I, my understanding is there are 25% of the voting rights are held by participant providers. That would have to increase to 75% um, in the new model. I do not know if they will change the number of board um, members or how those members will be um, selected, um, but um, they will have to be compliant with that um, uh, with that requirement uh, by January 1, 23. 
Well, my over and what, one more thing, just an update here that I caught um, having to do with uh, it might have to do with your um, uh, recommendation having to do with um, any SEC violations or DOJ. Um, the, there was a story in Reuters March 1st of 2022, uh, and the headline was U.S. District Judge uh, Alita Traeger in Nashville on Money declined to dismiss the case, allowing investors to proceed with allegations Clover lied about the source of its growth and the existence of a U.S. Department of Justice probe into the company. So that's the latest on that. My, my overall concern is that Vermont is very small. And this is a big entity, and I just worry that uh, on both the, the settlement and, and it seems that there's resistance to breaking out Vermont um, um, in, unless CMS does it, uh, Clover doesn't seem to want to do it. Um, these criteria that you've set forth, I, I read the email to Russ yesterday, and, and uh, uh, as, of, as of that email, there is an agreement to, to, to these um uh, uh provisions on the part of clover these are our recommendations but the handshake hasn't happened so um you know this this is a difficult one for me because i, I the, the the lack of transparency here uh uh for a program that might start out at 1800 vermonters but grow uh just concerns me and um i'll leave it at that for now thank you Thank you, Tom. Other board members? Hearing none, I'm going to go to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment? Walter? Hi, Kevin. Thanks. Um, all through this Clover Health thing, I've thought of a phrase by um, Woody Guthrie in his song about Pretty Boy Floyd, where he said, I've, through this world I've wandered, I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. The only difference between the two robberies is that one is legal and the other is illegal. Clover is the fountain pen. And I thank Tom for bringing up his concerns about Clover. Uh, I was just going to do that, but Tom pretty much said it. I have several concerns or a mountaintop of concerns actually, but having had to fight flame denials before and multitudes of them simply to get a procedure done, it bothers me that there is a middle person, a middle entity inserted in between a physician and a Medicare patient. And <clears throat> let's make no mistake about this, is that this is a scheme, the whole DCE or the whole ACOs, the whole ACO reach, et cetera, are merely schemes to siphon our Medicare off to Wall Street in return for political campaign donations for both Democrats and Republicans on the national level. The insurance companies did contribute greatly to Biden's <clears throat> election fund, and this is part of their reward. And to put a middle entity between a physician and Medicare and a patient, obviously that middle entity is going to start to deny they're going to want their profits. Clover is a started life as a venture capital firm um, <clears throat> and so forth. So that's what this whole thing is. We on Medicare, which is our money that these people are using, don't need Clover Health. We don't need DCEs, whoever they are. This is a scheme forced on us by CMS. We have absolutely no choice because if you get <clears throat> if your physician goes with clover or any dce for that matter you're automatically stuck with them and that should greatly concern the gmc gmcb it greatly concerns me both as a patient and as a being on the advisory board in that you suddenly have no decision no choice 
and then you get a note from Clover or any other DCE for that matter. And all of a sudden you get a third party making decisions between you and your physician about this or that treatment. Um, <clears throat> I also am nervous about the so-called quality measurements. A, um, the quality of one party is different than the quality of another. So what might be quality measurements for Clover might be different quality measures for me. You know, <clears throat> am I still sick? Do I still have the broken bones? But someone, some lawyer in Clover could say, aha, well, you did it, that was enough. So TS, it's your tough luck. And I've had insurers say that to me. So <clears throat> I'll kind of stop here to give others a chance to comment. And I also wanted to ask if the Green Mountain Care Board, through the various twists and turns of all these statures that are inflicted on us, has the ability to take punitive action against Clover for a not providing quality measures and the same concerns that Tom mentioned about the lack of transparency um, <clears throat> about carving Vermont out, for example. But how many claims would they deny? Is there a way to find out if Clover starts to deny claims, for example? Um, how can we track those? And how can we take action against them? Um, <clears throat> Again, having experienced all this before, Clover is not in Clover or any DCE or ACO REACH program is not a program that we need or particularly want, but it's been inflicted on us simply through Medicare's desire to sell it off to Wall Street. I'll shut myself up now. Thank you, Walter. The meetings are always made more enjoyable when uh, you get a quote from a, a song lyric. So thank you for that. I would say that uh, uh, if Clover was in violation of um, their budget order, that uh, there could be um, legal remedies um, that occur. As far as to your more um, focused point on the tracking, um, I think you've got a valid point that, that that will not be tracked. But Russ, do you have anything to say? Um, sure. So the board isn't waiving any of its enforcement authority here. We, the board retains its enforcement authority um, the same way it does with other ACO. Um, I, I think there's probably a clarification that's useful. Um, as part of the model here, CMS remains the entity that adjudicates claims, um, not the, the direct contracting entity. Um, but I, I, I'll leave it there and, and say that the board um, retains all of its uh, enforcement authority that it has under, under statute and rule. The question, Thanks, Russ. Russ, the question, Russ, is A, if Clover denies a healthcare claim from me, let's say, <clears throat> for a cancer or something or whatever, do I have to appeal it to CMS or? That's the question. Because that could take years or do I appeal it to the board or do I have to stick the lawyer, go to the lawyers and spend thousands of dollars on the lawyers? I think David Alt could answer yeah. this question, but I don't think yeah, I, I, they would be in the ability to deny that claim. Go ahead, David. Yeah, no, happy to jump in and, and echo what Russ said. So there is no claims adjudication by Clover. Clover has no say, or, or any ACO for that matter, has no say over what claim may be um, denied or otherwise. So the the claims administration process for when um, a patient goes to a doctor and the doctor submits the Medicare claim, that is completely untouched by sort of the, the ACO models and, and, and by this construct. So the claims that are submitted by the providers for patients, they go to the Medicare administrative contractors or the MACs 
um, the way they do now. And, and, and that process is wholly unchanged. So it's not in Clover's discretion whatsoever um, to, um, to, to change that, right? That would be a change to the Medicare benefit in some way. And, and there's certainly no rights to do that um, or, or to say that, you know, a claim would be approved or, you know, if you went to one doctor versus another doctor, right? There's no ability to steer care in that way either. Thank you, David. Next, I'm going to go to the Healthcare Advocates Office and Sam Peich. Thanks, Chair Mullen. I'll be super brief. Um, <clears throat> just want to say that we support the staff's recommendation, the final recommendations, and express our appreciation for Marissa and the staff's work and engagement with the HCA on this. Obviously, we've had concerns, um, which we've um, had a good dialogue and engagement with the board and the board staff. Um, and thank the board's attention um, to this matter before you. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, is a board member prepared to make a motion? Sure. Um, I move that we approve Clover Health Partners fiscal year 22 budget as submitted subject to the conditions outlined by the staff in today's meeting and represented on the slide. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Clover Health Partners fiscal year 22 budget as submitted subject to the Conditions outlined on the uh, slide that is currently being exhibited. Is there further discussion by the board? I just wanted to jump in and, and also echo thanks to the staff. Uh, this is the first time we've been through this process of a Medicare only ACO. And uh, certainly in this instance, there's been some uh, challenges in, ter in terms of jurisdictional issues, so um, I just appreciate their work in doing this for the first time. Hearing no other discussion, I'll call the motion. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Nay. And uh, Russ or Mike, do we need a roll call because it's not unanimous? Yeah, we should do it by roll call. Um, okay, could I you please do. call it? Yes. <clears throat> uh, Chair Mullen? Yes. Uh, board member Holmes? Yes. Uh, board member Lunge? Yes. Uh, board member Pelham? No. Uh, board member Walsh? Yes. Okay. So that uh, motion passed four to one. And I just want to say that as a yes vote, it's not so much that uh, uh, an endorsement of what is happening here, but recognizing the role that we have as the regulator. And uh, personally, I have a lot of concerns when it comes to um, this type of program and what the impact could be on the healthcare reform efforts that we have here in the state of Vermont. And uh, generally, I have um, concerns about uh, Medicare Advantage programs as well. And so um, I think, though, that we have to live within our statutory obligations and uh, therefore the yes vote. And um, I don't want to uh, send the message, David, that uh, Vermont is unfriendly. I just hopefully you get the message that Vermont is passionate about its health care reform efforts and hopefully you can uh, figure out a way to help us in that endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that has not been the, the feeling at all. And in fact, to echo what others have said, I mean, working with Russ and Marissa and others, they have been, you know, nothing but professional and wanting to be helpful in figuring out what's best for the state of Vermont and in answering Clover's questions and figuring out, you know, based on the data that they get from CMS, what are we able to provide versus not provide and, and so on. And 
And just, you know, st stepping back from my role in, in working with Clover, having been in the value-based care movement for a long time now, you know, I I see both its room for improvement and, and the opportunity for it to provide better care. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think Clover is on that path and, and Clover looks forward to working with the state to, to provide good quick care for Vermonters. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. So like others, I would like to uh, really uh, thank the staff for a very thorough presentation. And we do have 10 minutes before the start of the Rutland Regional Medical Center um, budget discussion. So I think we will um, get started rather than take a 10 minute break. And I would turn to the healthcare advocate if they could. Um, uh, we received um, the comments from the healthcare advocate today. And that is why I don't believe there will be a vote on guidance today. But I do want to um, hear from Mike Fisher or whoever he delegates um, about uh, the concerns. And Mike, if you could take it away. Um, hello, uh, Mr. Chair. I do notice that your court reporter is here, but I'm happy to proceed. Yes, please. I am here. Yeah, we yes. scheduled Rutland for two, so let's stick to the schedule. <laughs> okay. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, board members. Um, Mike Fisher here from the Healthcare Advocates Office, and um, I want to uh, recognize and appreciate that um, uh, we've been at this for a while, and in past years we've maybe done a bit of a better job of coordinating um, our efforts, and um, and uh, uh, appreciate that uh, things didn't go exactly according to plan, and um, that we can do better in future years. Um, given that, here we are today. Um, uh, and uh, doing our best to uh, let you know our thoughts about the uh, budget guidance. Um, so you you have our our document that we sent you today, and I appreciate, Mr. Chair, what you just said about um, making sure the board and board staff have an opportunity to, um, to to look at our guidance before you vote, and that a couple hours is probably not a reasonable amount of time to do so. Um, so we have a a couple of. Uh, uh, um, we've limited our questions uh, this year in deference to hospitals' increased workload um, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And as in previous years, um, the HCA will submit uh, separate comments expressing our concerns. Um, well, we, we will submit questions separately um, uh, that the board chooses not to include. The HCA also will uh, submit separate comments expressing our concerns about the new method used to calculate um, the recommended NPR budget. Uh, we're not prepared to do that at this moment. Um, as Vermont potentially moves to new ways of funding our hospitals, uh, it's more important than ever to have reliable, standardized, and transparent hospital data as well as clear guideposts for achieving our reform goals. With that in, in mind, uh, the HCA requests the board adopt um, a couple of recommendations. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them here now, but I will mention one very specifically. Um, this is not a new topic. Um, we continue to believe that it is vital that the board, for the board to adopt metrics to understand base hospital prices. Uh, we suggest asking hospitals in uh, for their commercial prices compared to Medicare. Um, we have drafted uh, a question in our um, in the attached in, in the document that we included. I want to recognize that that draft question worked for some hospitals and did not work for others, um, but that it is um, important that we find the right language to be able to compare. Um, charges across hospitals, especially as we consider new ways of funding hospitals. Um, so you, you'll also see board members um, a couple of themes that um, that you've seen in past years. We we continue to believe it's important to uh, focus on bad debt and free care. We ask the uh, we continue to have this focus. Uh, in the context of the voices we've heard from Vermonters 
that bad debt is a uh, pushes in exactly the wrong direction, the opposite direction uh, of our goal of right care at the right time, um, and that many Vermonters experience bad debt as a clear message that they um, that they should not or could not um, cannot uh, get the care that they need. Um, we uh, also suggest a uh, a set of questions about the um, about emergency Medicaid and um, and the new immigrant health um, health insurance plan, as well as deemed newborns. We we uh, at, we in our process of advocacy for people getting uh, uh, people without document um, without documentation getting the care they need. We have learned quite a bit about um, um, hospitals not billing through these uh, through this process, and um, that's both foregone revenue um, that the hospitals are not collecting it, um, as well as um, leaving these people with charges. Um, and lastly, um, Lastly, we do include a health equity section. I appreciate board staff for including a health equity question in in your um, guidance here. Uh, we think that it makes sense to go a step or two further into into details around health health equity, and have suggested a few um, a few examples of how to do so. Um, and I'll note one in particular that. Um, that comes to us really directly through our helpline. Um, and that's, you know, number C in that in that section, um, how hospitals handle complaints directly related to discrimination. And, um, and that's a, a particular um, particular kind of call that might come to our office that is uh, particularly hard for us to understand how um, how to support those people. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I think I'll um, I think I'll stop. Happy to answer any questions and uh, appreciate the process we're in. We're doing the best we can. Super. Thank you, Mike. And uh, um, it is my hope, Board, that we don't make a motion on guidance today. That uh, we thoroughly ponder and uh, fully understand what the healthcare advocate has recommended, and that we come back to this next Wednesday. Um, but that's me as one board member, so feel free to, to roll me, but otherwise uh, I would hope we don't do a, a vote today. So um, with that, I think this is the logical point to put a halt to the guidance discussion. We'll come back to it after uh, the RRMC discussion, but I see that both Claudio and, and Judy have joined us. We have the court reporter, and it looks like we could proceed with Rutland, and I'd prefer to do that and come back to the guidance a, a little bit later this afternoon. So with that, uh, Russ, if you could help me out, do um, Claudio and Judy have to be sworn in again? Um, it would be best if we swore them in again, yes. Okay. Kim, if you could swear in the, the witnesses. Sure. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. I do. Thank you. Okay. And Patrick, do you want to start out by giving Claudio and, and Judy an opportunity to respond to some of the questions? Or were you going to go through a staff analysis first? Or how do you wish to proceed, Patrick? Uh, we had planned to go through the slide deck with the updates as provided by Rutland for the board's edification. Uh, it should be relatively quick um, as they've been in the loop throughout the past week or so. And then if there are any lingering questions that uh, Judy or Claudio uh, need to answer to get the board to a comfortable place, uh, then we can proceed from there. OK, proceed. <clears throat> okay, Kim, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Excellent. All right, so we are here today on the 23rd of March, uh, revisiting the uh, mid-year budget modification request from Rutland Regional. 
Um, <clears throat> a quick overview of some of the uh, factors for consideration that uh, Russ McCracken went through last week as part of the GMCB rule 3.0. <clears throat> we received three overall public comments on this particular request. Uh, one was from Sarah Teachout of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and then we had two uh, unidentified members of the public uh, who chose to submit uh, public comment as well. Some changes from last week. Slides seven and eight have been updated to capture Rutland's total margin. That was a request on behalf of the board to provide a a uh, deeper picture of the impact and, pro and projection that Rutland has proposed as part of this uh, process here. Uh, slide 13, looking at the fiscal year 22 rate impact and the five-year average and five-year median has been changed to capture the full effect of the approved 9%, uh, which would be an increase to the base of 12.64% for the fiscal year 22. Slides 14 to 16 indicate how Rutland plans to implement the requested increase on a service level and indicates where Rutland uh, fits amongst their peers on uh, various samples. And that was some follow up questions uh, by board members <clears throat> last week that Russ, uh, Rutland divided by. And on slide 18, we amended that to capture where Rutland Regional's uh, current margin projection places their debt service coverage ratio compared to their debt covenant threshold that they spoke to at their presentation. Slide five, uh, again, just the, the reason for the request, kind of the cr chronological order of uh, the process here, the reason and the updates, the financial components. I won't go back over those from last week. Uh, just capturing some of the impact that Rutland is currently experiencing from uh, <clears throat> uh, the increased utilization uh, that they're seeing and the increased costs that they are uh, being burdened with and the request overall for 9% uh, above the 3.64 that was approved in September, the net patient revenue impact as approved and then as projected with and without uh, that potential amendment and the financial impact uh, potentially post approval uh, should the board approve that 9%, effectively shrinking their operating uh, margin from the 7.5 million that they're projecting now uh, to near break even at a loss of 187,000. So you can see that impact here on slide seven. This is the update. We've included the non-operating revenue as projected by Rutland, um, <clears throat> and therefore the total or excess margin at the bottom there for their projection uh, without the rate increase would be nearly $12 million loss. Uh, but with the increase, if approved, would be around 4.5 million. So a uh, significant recapture there as projected by Rutland. And here, just the same uh, type of perspective, but with some variances, uh, looking at the differences between uh, the budget, the projection, and the projection with rate increase, uh, and the difference between some of those measurables uh, across the uh, different variances here uh, provided for the income statement. <clears throat> Again, this slide is not changed here. It's just capturing some of the revenue growth that Rutland is experiencing as they laid out in their uh, written letter to the Green Mountain Care Board, and also where that would go with the uh, modification should it be approved by the board, uh, bringing uh, net patient revenues up to $307 million over their budgeted 270. The history of the operating margin for Rutland and the current first quarter experience that they've reported to the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and also their day's cash on hand. This does include uh, the Medicare advances that they spoke of. We have we do not break that out uh, in our current collections. Uh, so as of fiscal year or the end of the first fiscal quarter, Rutland sits at about 244 days cash on hand. And again, capturing the uh, history here of the last five years, Rutland is about middle of the pack on the five year average and the five year median. That was shifted significantly with the falling off of the 2017 negative 5.1 and the uh, oncoming 3.64 that they were approved for in September. Of note, too, uh, board member Holmes specifically asked us to place the uh, UVM Health Network's commercial effective rate back into this. Uh, slide as we have in the past. Uh, it should be noted though that that five-year average and five-year median are just for 2017 to 2021. They did not request an effective rate 
change in 2022. Uh, so that will not line up with uh, the 2018 to 2022 uh, perspective at the top. Uh, however, it does help counterbalance some of the figures in the change in charge where Porter uh, appears to be relatively very low compared to their peers. Uh, so that is placed back in there for some context. <clears throat> Again, looking at the five year, this is the change that we made. Uh, originally, we were looking at the effective impact for 2022, uh, but in hindsight realized that the base rate change is how we've assessed in the past. So we've made that change for fiscal year 2022, and you can now see the 12.64 if approved, and if they are granted that by the payer, that would be the impact that they would have for fiscal year 22, which would bring their five-year average up to 5.77. Uh, and if I pan back to this slide here, would effectively shift them up just under Springfield at 5.8%. There you can see at the bottom as one of the higher rates uh, over the last five years with this potentially approved rate here. Looking at how they distributed the rates, these are the service, the services that they uh, plan to apply the rate to and the gross and net revenues that they uh, intend to capture here with this request. Uh, and you can see there at the bottom to the overall request of 9% and the net revenue per percent value of that being over $820,000 <clears> thousand <throat> for a grand total of about $7.4 million in net reimbursement from the 9% request. So gross, they would take in about 31.8 million. They would net from that after deductions from revenue, contractual allowances, et cetera, about 7.4. <clears throat> they also supplied some samples of uh, Rutland's rates versus those of other hospitals across various services. So we can see here MRI, MRI rates, Rutland in 21, 22, their targeted rate versus Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, Central Vermont Medical Center, and UVM. And they propose similar looks for uh, CAT scan rates, <clears throat> lab rates, and bed rates uh, uh, as it compares to their peers at those other hospitals. And this was again requested by the board uh, to show the impact of or, or the position of where Rutland currently resides uh, on those various services. Uh, this slide has not been updated. This is just recapturing what their um, uh, ha had they uh, discussed this previously with some of the uh, third party payers, uh, and then what was their contingency plan? And Rutland noted that they did not have one as of yet, um, but it might uh, potentially challenge their capacity to meet some of their financial debt covenants. We'll revisit that on the next slide. Uh, and that they believe the services they offer are in alignment with the community's needs. Without the rate increase, Rutland may have to limit certain services, uh, which could have further utilization and cost implications, as many are tied to primary care. <clears throat> uh, we wanted to know originally if the mid year request had any impact on wait times, issues that they might be experiencing. They said no, this is entirely due to uh, work workforce pressures related to cost and inflation. Uh, and then to outline the final piece here. Uh, when we asked them about specific financial covenant triggers, uh, specifically that of debt service coverage uh, related to their bond covenants, <clears throat> that their projected loss and its impact on debt service coverage uh, would, would put their debt service coverage around 1.789. So as presented to you, um, if nothing changes, Rutland is projecting a loss of 7.5 million, which, would, which as they've calculated, uh, would mean that their debt service coverage ratio would fall to 1.79 for the year. Their covenant trigger is at 1.4. So what that means uh, is that uh, their lender has said, we require you to have $1.40 of cash generation from your operations to cover uh, your current portion of long-term debt, which is the principal interest ba uh, balances, <clears throat> you know, the principal interest uh, that you owe during the current period. So Rutland is saying that at that 7.5 million, that combined with depreciation, interest, and amortization <clears throat> over the, the uh, debt burden that they have to carry means that they would be able to produce $1.79 per dollar of debt service that they have to cover. And so they also went further and said, should our operating loss projection for fiscal year 22 drop to 9 million, that would be enough to trigger the 1.4. So if you, if no change is made to their current situation, they would fall to that 1.79 against the 1.40. Should the board provide uh, rate relief 
uh, to any extent, it would block them back from that 1.79 that they've provided for us uh, as follow up from last week's discussion. <clears throat> So with that, we've updated our staff recommendation in the sense that uh, what the overall rate change would be, and that's at 12.964. Once again, the recommendation by the staff is still uh, the 9% as we stated last week. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Patrick. And I think for the purposes of expediency, before I open it up to board questions, um, I'll allow Claudio or Judy to make any statement that they wish to make. And then we'll direct our questions to the three of you um, after that. Claudio, did you intend to say anything? Uh, yes, if that's possible, I'd appreciate just a, a few brief remarks to follow up also some of the conversation and questions we had last week. Um, you know, we walked you through uh, the reasons we're making this um, rate increase request. And I think it's, on, I don't think we've, ever come to you before mid-cycle to do that. Um, but I, 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 I wanna make sure people know that we don't make this request lightly. Um, you know, in particular, our board of directors who reviewed and approved us to submit this request before you, um, include some of the leaders of some of the largest employers, um, not just here, in Rutland County, but in our state, um, and some of the largest commercial insurance customers in our state. Um, so they understand, and maybe more than any of us in this virtual room, the impact that these rates have on the cost of health insurance for, for their struggling to continue to provide for their employees. And, and taking that into account, our board unanimously approved this request because they also understand and have seen firsthand the extreme and unprecedented inflationary pressures that have caused us to take this action. These are out of our control. Um, we've never seen in, in my 30 plus years of doing this, inflation happen so quickly and so rapidly and so extremely and we've had a lot of shocks in labor and so forth over the years. They approved this request because they understand that our hospital needs some immediate relief and some time to pivot from pandemic crisis response activities to work on some of the human resource and financial strategies we're putting in place to mitigate uh, the impact. And they approved this request because they understand that the other options we face have much greater impact on our community, and especially the most vulnerable in our community that we're proud to serve. Um, you know, I, I again, it's just been um, two months ago when we were in the middle of the worst part of the whole pandemic crisis, um, and the majority over the of our work over the past two years here has been um, very simple. Protect, protect our patients, protect our staff, and make sure Rutland Regional was able to continue to provide access to critical health services during the most devastating public health crisis in our lifetime. I'm tremendously proud of all that our staff have done over the past two years to ensure we've accomplished this mission and that we were there for this community in the time of need. But that's not, I, I think it's also important for you to know that's not all we did over the past two years. We also looked and took advantage of reducing overhead costs where we could. Uh, we had uh, a painful layoff. Uh, we downsized our staff. Um, and and while preserving frontline uh, clin clinicians and you know, today we have one fewer vice president position than we had two years ago. You know, we've also taken a look at the service offerings we provide. We've taken a look at, you know, what the contribution margins are for these. And we took a look at the clinical and population health impact of that work. 
And we found through this examination over the past year that there's very limited opportunity to reduce services without a significant impact to our mission to improve the health of our community. And, and let me just uh, kind of give you just a couple of quick examples where Rutland Regional stepped up to address some of the most pressing um, community health needs, not just for locally, but on a statewide level. And, and um, you know, if you look 15 years ago, in the midst of the opiate crisis, Rutland Regional responded to the community need by developing the Westridge Center. Before Rutland Regional took this action and started this new program, there was no medicated assisted treatment program in Rutland County. We provide methadone and suboxone treatment along with counseling and support. And today there's about 400 people in our community that can now be gainfully employed and be present for their families because they're no longer suffering from the scourge of substance use disorder. 10 years ago, in the wake of the devastation of Hurricane Irene and the overnight destruction of the Vermont State Psychiatric Hospital in Water, Waterbury, Rutland Regional again stepped up and partnered with, our, with the state leaders to expand our existing psychiatric services to include six, six beds of level one inpatient psychiatric care. And we provide care to some of the most acute psychiatric patients in the state through that program. It's an essential part of our mission and we're extremely proud and we've made a big impact, not just locally, but on a statewide level in, in the psychiatric crisis we're dealing with. And then just five years ago, we stepped up and, and to participate in the One Care Accountable Care Organization, taking on risk and doing a lot of work to revamp the way in which we deliver care to really work at looking at how we can improve value and lower costs without addressing access for quality. So these are just a couple of many programs and services that we feel are essential, but are also higher risk and lower margin. You know, on the hospital side of the equation, we could lower our hospital cost structure by reducing or eliminating essential programs like these. But while this might make the hospital look good in the short term or the immediate term, I don't think that these actions will help in the bigger picture that we have of, and will actually increase health care costs and other less visible and shift those costs to other parts of, of the health care system. So, uh, you know, we've worked hard and, and if you look at our rate increases and in our budget submissions, um, you know, Judy and her staff and, and all the staff here at Rutland Regional. We've worked really hard to play by the rules and, and to meet your guidelines. You know, in fact, it, it dropped off the five year look, but we were one of uh, just a couple of hospitals back in 2017 that actually significantly decreased our rates. Um, so folks, I, I mean, as you make your determination, I just ask you to keep in mind, you know, Rutland County, our hospital service area, we serve some of the most vulnerable and socioeconomically challenged people in our state. Uh, we also have, um, you know, I saw uh, Mike Fisher on, we also have perhaps the most liberal financial support program in, in Vermont because of the community we serve. So these are not normal times and we respectfully ask for your consideration give us the opportunity to address these challenges and rebuild our workforce and, uh, and to move forward and try to bring these costs down. So thank you for your time. Thanks for the ability to um, say a few words. Thank you, Claudio. So we're gonna move to uh, board questions and comments and I'll start off. Um, I'll ask uh, you, Claudio, or maybe Judy, this question is better for you, but. How confident are you in your current projections for the rest of the year? Sure, so um, those projections are tied with our ability to reduce our dependence on travelers. And so they're tied with our workforce strategies and our investments in our compensation package. 
Um, and so we are seeing some relief. That relief needs to continue. Uh, we also, as of May 7th, will be eliminating all of our incentive programs uh, to get staff to pick up additional shifts. Uh, that is included in those projections. So uh, we are really, um, you know, banking on this investment in workforce to help us out um, and eliminate some of these high cost um, programs for staffing. Okay, my second question. Um, Claudio is you were here last week when we heard Sarah teach out uh, speak eloquently on on why uh, uh, they're opposed to this type of adjustment. Then they sent follow up um, uh, an official statement from Blue Cross. Again, I'll ask, have you reached out to your carriers? Are, are we doing all this for not in that? Is there any indication that uh, they will grant you these increases if we approve them? Uh, we believe uh, so. Um, again, we haven't done a mid-year rate increase, but the the um, practice that we've had with our payers is, uh, you know, after we submit our budget and the Green Mountain Care Board approves it, um, we have the rate increase and, and they follow suit. So um, sure, they could come back and try to renegotiate this on a kind of a secondary market, if you will, with us. That has not been our relationship or practice or experience. So a couple of follow ups to that. Um, one is, have you had any conversations since last week with your carriers? And two, um, in the normal budget process, when we approve a, a change in charge, that that takes effect on January 1. And can they actually quickly turn around in one week's time um, this type of change? Judy, you know the mechanics of this better. Than, I can't speak for them, uh, Mr. Chairman, and and uh, but Judy, you know the mechanics of how we put this in place better than I do. Sure. I just want to gain some clarity and. The term them, are you referring to the carriers or Rutland Regional Medical Center? I'm referring to the carriers because I'm sure that you could provide them with the uh, um, the new um, charges, but whether or not uh, they could do whatever they have to do in their system to process uh, those changes is the question, really. I know that uh, um, there's always been a uh, matter of months in the normal budgeting process, but um, we have been told in previous um, request for a mid-year that the carriers needed at least 30 days, which they don't have here. So I'm just just trying to get to the bottom of this. Are you really going to get it by April 1st, which is a week away, even if it's approved today? Or are we really looking at something further in the future? So I don't want to speak for the carriers, um, but we have um, our plan in place that we can take care of our charge system here. This charge uh, process isn't any different than any other billing process. I don't think it requires any development um, or change in process uh, for carriers. It requires a conversation, um, but I, I don't believe there's a lead time. But again, I don't want to speak for the carriers on that. You know, we're currently in a situation where 1800 Vermonters are using are being used by pawns between UVM and United Healthcare, and for them, it's a frightening uh, reality that they may be without uh, coverage as of April 1st. If they want to stay with the same providers they've always been with, otherwise they're going to have to uh, drive significantly to um, go to a United Healthcare. Um, uh, approved location. And so um, I, I do worry that uh, there could be some adverse consequences if somebody says, no, we're not going to give you what what uh, the board has approved for you. I, I have serious concerns about that. I have serious concerns about the timing. I also, um, Judy, you, you scared me more today when you said that um, if you're able to cut down on travelers, that's part of your your uh, projection.
for the your your losses and um I'm just curious if you have any any solid reason to believe that you will be able to cut down on travelers. Yeah, so we just had a discussion today on um, bed capacity and inpatient capacity and where we're at. We are seeing you know, a bit of softening with uh, the reduction in COVID care, particularly on the inpatient side. That is a direct um, influence on our need for travelers. So we are matching that demand with the need for travelers. Um, we have taken some travelers out of the system. We continue to do that. We also continue to um, advance our uh, recruitment and hiring process. We have 21 new grads uh, that we have uh, hired. Um, we're waiting for them to graduate, pass their NCLEX, um, and then they will be absorbed into our organization. Uh, so so have, what would their start dates be? Uh, it, it will vary uh, based on the individual throughout the summer um, and their orientation period varies depending on what unit they land on. Could any be anywhere from a three month orientation on a med surge floor to close to a year in uh, orientation on um, an, an ICU floor. It, it, as well. Kevin, we, we can't answer the question. I mean, we're in an unprecedented time in healthcare. We've never been through anything like this. We've seen supply shocks. We've seen the ups and downs and especially nursing and, you know, uh, physical therapists and so forth, you know, and respiratory, you know, pharmacists. We've seen those up and never have we seen anything as rapid, extreme and unprecedented where we've been paying a critical care nurse uh, on an annualized basis, a traveler $500,000 per year. And it's between doing that or not having the bed available and having a patient in our emergency room gasping for breath. I mean, um, we, you know, we certainly are working as hard as we can with expanding the pipeline, doing innovative things, recruiting and retention is job one. And without that, none of this stuff, quality finance, anything, it's all hinging on hinging on that. So we're doing a lot of work, but this these forces are out of our control. And, you know, we are very hopeful and we're very working diligently and putting in the best plans that we can come up with. But again, this is just an unprecedented time and what we don't wanna do. And if we, you know, if we can't do this, we don't wanna shut down critical bed resources. Um, we don't, you know, we've worked like heck to continue to provide this because we've seen, and I think this doesn't help any of our causes, delaying care or not getting people to the right care increases our costs and some of our challenges down the road. We've seen it very clearly with the pandemic. So, um, you know, we're the, you know, we have the only other uh, ICU that is staffed by full-time intensivists and it's been a critical resource during this pandemic. We want to make sure that we keep all those programs open. So, I mean, I don't mean to sound um, defensive in any way, but it's just the reality of the situation is this whole thing is unprecedented. Thank you. I'll open it up to other board members for questions or comments from either Patrick or Claudio or Judy. How about this? How about uh, I, I call on you in reverse alphabetical order, beginning with our newest member, Tom Walsh. Tom. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I raised my hand, let me put that down. Um, I wanna just start off by uh, thanking Claudio and Judy for everything that they've done um, taking care of Vermonters. Um, I do, I do wanna push back against the unprecedented aspect, yes, this is a pandemic. There hasn't been one in many, many years. Um, but healthcare organizations that are several hundred million dollar organizations have faced tens of millions of dollars of loss in a year. That's not unprecedented. And with the change toward more value-based payments, capitation, bundled payments, um, different um, things like that, there's a budget. And you have to stay within the budget. There's no asking for a mid-year correction in those plans. Um, 
organizations that have, in my experience, that have successfully transitioned have dealt with um, those capitated um, budgets. They've come to see their charges um, that they don't reflect accurately the time, the activities, and the location of care. Right? They reflect. They're more a reflection of market power. And those organizations that have been successful have transitioned and learned new cost allocation methods to better understand the true cost of the time, the activities, and the location of care. And they've moved away from disagreements over charges and reimbursement. And so the, that's the situation as I see that we're, we're moving toward. Yes, this is a pandemic. None of us have ever been through it before. But stepping back, an organization that does several hundred million dollars of business facing a loss of tens of millions, that's not unprecedented. Still, I'm concerned that a rapid change in how an organization tries to deal with being paid, that could be really damaging in a resource limited environment. So I've tried to work with our staff and done as much research as I can on my own in a short amount of time to see what's your financial situation. Look at total margin, operating margin, days cash on hand, any measure that I can, and compare that to other organizations, other hospitals in Vermont, the region, the nation. And, and like I really want to try to get to a place where I'd be okay with a mid-year correction but your organization looks well above the median on all those measures. And so I don't have a question. Those are just my comments. I appreciate everything you're doing to take care of people. Um, I, I really do. And I think dealing with sickness and death day in and day out is exhausting. I've, I've been part of it. It's hard to get to a place with the way that healthcare is trying to change to agree to a mid-year correction. Back to you, Chair. Thanks, Tom. Now we'll go to the next Tom, Tom Pelham. Um, th this, is, this is, these are very tough times and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about them not only in terms of the immediate needs, but in terms of the long term needs and um, and uh, you know that you know so much is happening here outside our traditional budget process that it makes it more difficult there. Um, you know, in our normal budget process, we kind of know what the legislature has done. Um, we have been through rate review with the carriers and there's some, you know, uh, structure to it. And this is you know, this is kind of making it up as we go along here. And I, I worry a little bit about setting a precedent here. Um, but I also know both of you um, and have a very high respect for your affection for the institution that you work for, you know, and that, that what you've done for the Rutland community. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, in terms of the non-operating revenue that, um, that uh, you've added now that we're, we're kind of talking about total margin a, a little bit. Um, in your 2022 budget, you had unrealized gains and losses at a positive $5.5 million gain. And now with your projected budget for 2022, you have um, unrealized gains and law, uh, an unrealized gain loss at a negative $6.7 million. So that's a 12.2, 12.3 million dollar swing. I'm just wondering what uh, what's behind that. Sure. So um, that's actual market performance. Um, what you see in the numbers we presented are actual performance uh, through February, um, and so we have suffered that loss. What this uh, projection uh, entails, and this is goes goes uh, to Chair Mullen's question, we have not assumed any additional loss in the investment portfolio going forward. So these are the losses to date and we've just held them. So these are paper losses. It's not that you've actually cashed in the asset and it's gone. It's just, these are investment losses? 
These are investment losses. That's correct. So since February, they might have got, I mean, I'm, I'm not playing market here, but the market's improved a little bit. So these might be a little bit better than what, what you profiled here. I, I think we're in for a period of some great volatility. Um, I wouldn't nope. object to say uh, an end. I'm not going to argue with you about that. And, and um, if I might, if I might add, um, their paper losses, but they, but they do have to be marked to market on our financial statements that we submit to, um, yep. you know, our lenders, et cetera. Yep. So my next question was, um, I think at near the end of the our hearing um, on the last on the 22 budget cycle, I uh, um, uh, applauded your position that you did not, that you were not going to raise rates as I recall it to non hospital providers in the community who use hospital services that you were going to keep those flat. And uh, I was kind of being my conservative self at time and saying, well, why don't you get a little bit more money out of them? And, and, uh, and, uh, you, you know, you basically said that if you didn't have to do it. You weren't going to do it. Um, so have you, if I have you gone back to some of your non-hospital providers um, and, and, and actually raised the rates since this pandemic has unfolded, or have you, are you holding the position that you held back during the 2022 budget hearing that you were trying not to raise rates on your non-hospital community providers? Mm, I, 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 Judy, can you help? I, I, I guess uh, I, I don't quite follow. I, I think, you know, where we don't get much of rate increases when the hospital based providers, uh, the clinics were paid off a fee schedule. And so there is, you know, that is an area that we get very little yield out of um, rate increases. Okay. Um, and finally, if maybe Judy can, she probably can't, but if she can, if she, as you work through your 2023 budget um, process, the beginnings of it are thinking about it as to how all of this rolls out into 2023. Um, you, the last time we talked, you, you, you said that um, you would expect that, you know, the, uh, maybe the budget wouldn't go down on an absolute basis, but the, some of the pressures that you have built in that hopefully are one time pressures you know, would would fall by the wayside do you do you have any uh, more insight uh into that now um so so we are working uh, through that budget process uh, we've just begun looking at some of those high level assumptions but yes you're right there are one time costs uh, that are related to COVID or even some of our retention and recruitment uh, that will go away. Um, we don't have any chance to bring uh, those programs back in, in play. Obviously, we have to contemplate what our um, cost of living and our compensation package looks like, um, but we are looking at uh, those uh, costs that were related to um, care that we may not need to provide um, or a service we don't need to provide. Mm -hmm. And let me add, add one more thing on here. Um, if we were to approve an increase, uh, but it's not a 9% increase, it might be an increase more tied toward your enhancing your your debt coverage ratio, et cetera. Um, do you think, given your experience with the carriers, that that would make any difference as opposed uh, at, at it being, say, rather than a 9% level, it being at something less. Um, is it six of one and a half dozen of the other? And, and or do you think the, uh, the carriers would be more amenable at a lower rate increase? I, I don't think they'll be happy at any price. That's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next, we'll move to board member Lunge, Robin. Thank you. Um, so I had a question related to the de debt service ratio and and what that is, and I apologize because I could have probably looked this up, um, but I didn't have a chance before the meeting, but where is it right now? 
or, you know, I don't know how frequently you update it, but. Yeah, so, so as of February, it was 6.2. Okay. With this projection and un unmitigated through a, a charge uh, adjustment, it would fall to about 1.8. Covenant is 1.4. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. I just needed context for where we were now in relationship to the projections that you provided. Um, I had a question also about um, reserves. So certainly in normal times, seeing reserves on a one-time or ongoing basis certainly would not be a sound financial practice, I would imagine. But to your point that there's a lot of unique pressures uh, in, in the current situation, I'm wondering if you could speak to reserves and why that shouldn't be an option for at least a partial offset of your request. So what I, I would argue is it is part of our offset to our request. If you look at our reserves and you look at where we were at the end of September, our last completed fiscal year, and you look at where we are projecting to end with this loss, uh, that's a 25% decline in, in the measure of days of cash. So it goes from somewhere in the neighborhood of 280 days to about 205 or so. So we have um, used cash reserve, and by cash reserve, I really mean investments. Uh, and to fund operations, we have not funded an operating margin. We have had slim operating margins over the last five years. And so, uh, you know, for us to take care of our debt service, pension, uh, improvements in capital, we need an operating margin of about seven and a half million dollars uh, from a cash flow perspective. Thank you, Judy. Um, and then I had one last question um, related to the answer to Kevin's questions around um, the relationship with the carriers. And so um, recognizing you haven't done a mid-year increase, um, but that in general with rate increases, the practice has been for carriers to follow. and. Um, before I ask the question, let me just note that if there are confidentiality issues to this, we can figure out another way to get the answer potentially, and I'll ask Russ to help with that. Um, but is that because your reimbursement is calculated as a set percentage of charge? So if you increase the charge, that reimbursement automatically increases? Or um, is there, is it I, just help me understand that. I'm trying to understand if that's because the carriers have just been cooperative or if there's actually something in the contract which would uh, automatically increase the reimbursement if we, if the charge changes. So um, our contracts have a bit of both. We have some fee schedule, um, but we've taken that into account and then we're we're a percentage of charge. OK, thank you. Um, and then I don't have any other questions, but I did want to recognize that, you know, it was unprecedented when Rutland in the past came in and asked for a rate decrease. Um, and I actually think that was a mid-year request uh, prior to your time, Claudio, um, recognizing where you were in relationship to the NPR uh, approved budget. And so, you know, I do, I have seen you as an institution, be very responsive to your community and thoughtful about those issues. So I do want to recognize that and thank you for that. Um, it is tough uh, to, as other folks have said, you know, the mid-year increase is just tough. Um, and I, for me, um, you know, I think about certainly your needs, but also trying to balance that against employer needs and the impacts of others. So uh, I'll just say this is a really tough decision. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board, board member Holmes. Jessica. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo the tough decision part, obviously. Uh, I think you can see us all struggling, and I, I want to recognize I know you've struggled too, and even the decision to come before the board would probably uh, was a struggle. Um, I also want to recognize, you know, the great work done by Rutland Regional and that, you know, these unanticipated inflationary pressures and COVID expenses clearly have compromised Rutland's financial health. And I think through no fault of your own. Um, and, and in fact, I think some rate adjustment may need to be made. Um, but I, and it's also worth pointing out, I think that, you know, Rutland's budget was among the most conservative we had this year. So the position that you're finding yourselves in may not be, as, you know, as surprising as it may be for other hospitals. Um, and I, I actually, I had I had written down in my notes, you know, to mention and to re remind folks that you are the only hospital that I can remember in my tenure at the board that actually has come in for a mid-year uh, rate reduction. And so I do appreciate that, you know, you have you're working on both sides here um, for your community. Uh, but. You know, I guess I would say, well, I'm open to the possibility of some rate increase. I would say that I'm not quite ready to vote on the full rate request at the moment. I think I need a little bit more information. First, in my mind, I a, a mid-year commercial rate increase should be taken as an absolute last resort, as I, I we can all imagine. Uh, it is going to have an immediate and significant impact on patients in your community, on self-insured employers in your community who may not have the reserves to cover what now is an unexpected growth in prices. Um, so I guess I'm not yet convinced that there's been no stone left unturned and this is the last resort. And in particular, I would like to hear directly actually from DIVA and AHS that there's no way to adjust Medicaid rates to account for these unforeseen inflationary pressures that are threatening hospital solvency, contributing to hospital insolvency. Uh, and that there are no additional state or federal funds available to shore up our hospitals. You know, some of this is one time expenses. That's what some of that federal funding and state funding is for. So I don't know, Chair Mullen, if there's a possibility of inviting DIVA and AHS to come to the board to help us understand Medicaid's role here, how that global commitment cap works, whether we're really up against it, and whether there are still state and federal funds available to offset COVID-related hospital losses. For me to approve a, uh, a rate increase of this magnitude, I need to be assured that there literally is no other stones that we can you know, uncover to find some funds elsewhere. Uh, so My just, second, I, just to answer that yep. question, I know that Susan did reach out and um, invite the commissioner of DIVA, but it was a, a last minute uh, invite um, that did not go out until late in the afternoon yesterday. So it's, I'm not surprised that we didn't get a, a quick response back. Susan, have you heard anything? I have not heard anything at this point. I can reach back out with um, that request from board member Holmes. Yeah, and Thank it doesn't you. surprise me. I mean, she's very busy and uh, getting a request at the last minute. Uh, um, I, I'm sure it no, was. I'm, I'm wondering if somebody if, this, if they might be able to come in next week, right? If we're going to if, if this if this vote is not done today, if we do it next week, is there time? So and also from AHS to the degree that there are federal and state funds available to offset these losses. I would want to hear about that as well, just to know that there are, that's it. You know, the well is dry on both fronts um, would be helpful. So I, I guess I would say that to me, that's information that I need. If others feel ready to vote today and don't need that information, I'm, I, I, I can happily abstain. Um, and I guess my second concern is that a commercial rate increase, as we know, is forever baked into the base. So what I, what I need to understand a little bit better is which of the increased costs that are driving these losses are ongoing and which are transitory to the degree that permanent wage increases that are higher than expected and, and are going to carry forward. Uh, that's different to me than higher ex than expected travelers costs that are likely to be temporary, uh, particularly if utilization is, is already declining and the use of travelers is already declining. Um, you know, in my mind, the former, you know, these permanent wage increases that are now baked into, into labor contracts going forward, that might merit a rate adjustment because those costs are going to be permanent. Um, the latter, this is where some of the other board members' questions, some of those might be better addressed by drawing down on cash reserves. If the hospital is in a position to do that without breaking bond covenants and or dipping below industry standards. So I, I it would be helpful for me to better understand which of the 
costs going forward are permanent, which of them are transitory. And uh, a third concern I have is that it's not really clear to me necessarily, given some of the you know the feedback we've gotten from at least uh, one carrier that 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 this is going to be possible and a rate increase could even be operationalized. So a suggestion I'm going to throw out there to other board members would be to uh, suggest to R Rutland to engage with the primary carriers in the state, negotiate directly with them what is reasonable, what is operational, and then return to the Green Mountain Care Board when an agreement has been reached and we can make a decision about a rate increase based on that mutually agreed upon rate. So those are some of the thoughts I have. I don't know if Claudio and Julia, you want to address any of them, um, but that's that's where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, I, I mean, a couple of those. Mo I, I, and I think we provided a breakdown in our information that we've submitted. Most of those costs that we're facing are, are permanently baked in inflationary trends. Um, we had budgeted for a 3% uh, wage increase. And when we negotiated with our nursing union, we settled on a 10% this year rate increase, along with an 8% retention bonus. Um, and these are, um, you know, significant labor costs that are that are trending forward. Um, and we felt we needed to be there, keep literally keep the doors open. And when you had traveler costs, we would have, you know, you get into a downward spiral. You have nurses leave or they move on to be travelers and come, you know, so um, and I think that's I think that's worked um, and and stabilized our nursing workforce first and foremost. The pharmaceutical cost pressures that we're seeing, um, I would imagine, I can't predict what's going to happen, but uh, we've seen no relief on those over years, over year over year. And then all the inflationary pressures that every single business, um, you know, we are getting it from our suppliers, add-ons like we did back in the previous energy shocks that we experienced, add-ons for delivery charges. Um, cost of food has gone up um, significantly. All of those costs, uh, we don't see relief on, on that front. Um, and uh, I mean, health care isn't the only sector to to raise prices and costs. I, I understand your the challenges with this, but um, Judy, you might be able to be a little bit more specific than I was. Yeah, so I, what are the oh, sorry, I was just gonna say specifically what are the travelers costs that you are anticipating you won't carry forward as you reduce your your travelers there? That would be one example. But go ahead, Judy, please. Yeah, so in part, uh, there you're absolutely right. There are some one time costs, uh, but we've had one time revenue offsets. So included in this projection is seven point four million dollars of federal funding that we had not anticipated that came in with that phase four funding and a second tranche of FEMA. Uh, so those have been included in this projection to offset some of those one-time costs. Um, in terms of travelers, we're, we're setting our, our budget. We'll have to figure out where we think our turnover rate is, where our ability to, you know, our, our, we can hire in um, and we'll come forward with travelers. We will have travelers in our budget. And then the second question is where are traveler salaries going, um, and that you know we're we're going to have to make a a good estimate on that. But thank you. Are there any follow up questions from board members? Yeah, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. As a member of the public, as a, someone who pays taxes and premiums, I echo all of the concerns that every board member has has spoken of um, 
gratifying it is also gratifying to hear everything that that Rutland has done over the years and I do want to remind them that the hospital exists for us, not we for them. And I think our healthcare, our private business model healthcare, which is partly responsible for all this, forgets that. And <clears throat> I just wanted to end with a quote from our dear, wonderful Maggie Thatcher in that <clears throat> as a socialist, I'm always getting that. Thatcher's quote, the trouble with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. The real problem is, is that should be attributed to our capitalist model. And eventually Vermonters are not going to be able to pay any more of these rate increases. It's just not going to be, it's just not going to happen. <clears throat> That's all from Walter, Kev. Thank you, Walter. Is there other public comment? Does any board member wish to make a motion at this time? I'm I'm kind of with Jess. I need a little more time to think about it. But if somebody else would like to make a motion, please do. So I'm I'm uh, listened very carefully to uh, Jess's questions. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'd rather know more. I'd rather know everything that we can know uh, before we decide what we do. And I, I don't think we're there yet. Okay. In fairness to uh, our RMC, I don't want this dragging out forever. So. Susan, if if uh, you could try to find the earliest possible date that um, we could have information either in person or written um, back from um, DIVA or AHS um, to answer Jess's questions, um, that would be very helpful. And uh, again, time is of the essence. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to really complicate any possibility of an April 1 turnaround. So uh, with that being said, um, I'll ask one more time. It doesn't look like anybody wishes to make a motion. So Susan, are you under are you clear on the questions that uh, the board needs uh, answers to? Yes, I am. Great. If I'm you could work it. with Patrick to uh, try to get those and uh, Claudio, I know I can't give you homework, but I would ask you again, if there's any way that you could try to confirm with some of your carriers that we're not just doing this for not, um, that would be very, very helpful to us. And I apologize that no decision is likely to be made today, but we will try to um, be as expeditious as possible to let you know. Even if it's a decision that you may not like, I think you you uh, are yeah, we owed. Need, yeah, we need to. Owed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the longer this goes on, you, you know, the the less time we have to pivot. I mean, so that's the that's the challenge because we do need to react. Understood, and and. Uh, we will try to go as expeditiously as possible. So with that, we'll adjourn the uh, uh, RRMC um, discussion. And I don't want to say we'll take this back up on Wednesday because Susan, if you could get someone in on Monday um, that could answer questions, that would be better. If you could get someone in tomorrow or Friday, that would be better. Um, but let's uh, let's see where we end up and Claudio will be in communication and uh, we'll try to get you an answer. So with that, we're going to switch over to a discussion on guidance and Patrick, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Excuse you. me, this is the court report. I just want to make sure I, that's all you needed me for, correct? Was the Rutland? Yeah, it was channel? just for the Rutland uh, discussion. Yep. That's all. OK, so I'll drop off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate it. Good to see you.
Thank you. And Patrick, we can see your screen. So whenever you're ready, proceed. Great. All right, we will switch gears here to the uh, hospital budget guidance discussion <clears throat> where we're going to uh, stick with the, the theme from last week, just discussing some of the changes that were made based on uh, board feedback from last week's meeting. And so I'm going to continue with the uh, split screen look here to keep from toggling too much and making uh, the folks following along dizzy. So I'm going to start here. <clears throat> By getting into the uh, the slide deck here again, just kind of recapping uh, last week, we took our initial look at this as as the board. Um, here we are on March 23rd, looking at the second iteration of this. Um, we do have still the potential vote in here. However, um, as we discussed at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the HCA's contributions uh, came in this morning after we spoke with them uh, this past Monday, and so we don't recommend that the board vote until they've had time to consider that. And I think that's the, the narrative that we've heard so far. So that would take us into next Wednesday, March 30th, kind of the final iteration of the guidance and the vote. <clears throat> we did receive one public comment uh, by Vaz. Uh, we received that uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, and that has been posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website as it relates to the fiscal year 23 hospital budget guidance process. <clears throat> as of last week, just recapping some of the changes that had been made uh, as we looked at that initial guidance. I won't go back through all of these. Uh, we're kind of taking a step by step approach here as we have in years past. So highlighting some of the changes that were initially made to the guidance for your consideration. And that includes some changes made to the uh, appendices. And then also uh, the discussion around NPR growth and the discussion around how the Green Mountain Care Board would like to continue with the access to care and wait times monitoring for fiscal year 23. Which brings us to the changes that we've made since the discussion last week, and we'll start getting into uh, the guidance portion of this as well to highlight that so you can see it in real time here. Uh, so in section one, uh, we have in the guidelines and benchmarks, we have added fiscal year 19 and 20 uh, as a prescriptive addition so that the board may evaluate 23 based on the activity that's occurred over the last couple of years. So that would be 19, 20, 21, and now the projection for 22. Uh, and the impetus for that was that with all of the fluctuations that have occurred in the COVID-19 span of time, uh, it's important to have some context that uh, takes us back to the beginning of the pandemic and also pre-pandemic as well when looking at some of these budgets as we move into a forward-looking uh, perspective in fiscal year 23. In section 1C, factors considered for review, uh, we did add the including patient mi migration data language that was requested and we removed the context of sustainability as that work is now going to be pertaining to the hospital budget process and not hospital sustainability. And the data that's coming out of that will be for the use here uh, in this decision making and regulatory process. So we've uh, catered that language to meet that request, <clears throat> uh, but nothing else in that section has changed. Moving down into section 3A, which is the executive summary, uh, we have added language around specific service lines as something that the Green Mountain Care Board should know about, changes specifically, such as staffing, specific service lines. Uh, and then we've built out the language as requested around sustainability planning to read um, <clears throat> COVID-19 and engagement sustainability planning at the hospital, specifically pertaining to sustainability planning. Please describe how the hospital is preparing to engage in sustainability planning with the Green Mountain Care Board. As you recall, we had taken kind of a vague or higher level perspective on that before, uh, but it was requested that we outline that a little bit more specifically to get an understanding from uh, the hospitals about what their plans are uh, to engage with the Green Mountain Care Board as sustainability planning moves forward. So we've covered that uh, request as well. Uh, moving down into um, <clears throat> section uh, three, B number two, uh, we, it was requested of us that we provide some productivity statistics around uh, FTE per adjusted occupied bed, occupancy rate and average daily census for fiscal year 23 versus 22 and 21. So we can see uh, your expectations for 23 compared to the last couple of cycles. 
Um, these are in there as a request from last week's feedback uh, to look at uh, some of the activity that's occurring in that space as it relates to the utilization component of uh, these budgets. <clears throat> Moving along to the next section here, section 3B3, charge request. We did add uh, that the hospital should describe how the charge request affects the areas of service, specifically inpatient, outpatient, and professional services. And that is for their fiscal year 23 request. And then at the bottom was some of the following, the follow updates uh, that we were discussing last week around the approved charge for fiscal year 22, also discussing uh, how that uh, rate impact uh, <clears throat> hit the areas specifically of inpatient, outpatient, and professional services. The next component here is section 3B7, and we built out uh, a component here as a request around support for subsidiaries. Uh, we're looking for the name of the subsidiary, the budgeted amount of subsidy that will be required as part of the hospital's budget, and the financial impact that will have on the subsidiary. So if you are uh, budgeting $2 million in your operating margin that will be transferred to your subsidiary, what type of impact is that $2 million going to have on that subsidiary? Is it going to bring them to break even? Is it going to mitigate a $3 million, $3 million loss to a $1 million loss? Or will it return the organization to a level of profitability? So a little more detail there, if you're basing your budget and your request around the need to help subsidize another organization. We want to hear a little bit more about it to give the board some fuller context around the request that you're making. <clears throat> Moving on to slide seven and continuing within the guidance document, uh, section 3C around equity. Uh, we were asked to build that component out with some definitions here, so we used the RAND uh, definition around health equity measurement as an approach to illustrating or summarizing the extent to which quality of health care provided by an organization contributes to reducing disparities in health and health care at the population level for those patients with greater social risk factor burdened by improving the care and health of those patients. <clears throat> so hopefully that helps provide a little bit of uh, context to what we're looking for there and how we're thinking about uh, health care equity. So we've met that. I believe we've met that request by the board as well. Um, Moving into the wait times piece, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we wanted to hear feedback from the board about how uh, they feel we should approach that. And so we've taken taken some uh, an effort here to have the hospital report uh, for each hospital owned practice, primary care and specialty care, as well as top five most frequent imaging procedures. Uh, specifically, please report for each practice and imaging procedure, the referral lag, which is the percentage of appointments scheduled within two days of referral and the visit lag, which is the percentage of new patients seen within two weeks, one month, three months, six months of their scheduling date. And that can be found in uh, section 3D under wait times, which is a new ad in total from the prior week. <clears throat> uh, getting down into risks and opportunities here, section 3E4, uh, we've added several topics related to workforce. This, there was a lot of dialogue last week around uh, how to approach uh, some of the workforce components. Uh, and we, as we've heard from hospitals through the fiscal year 21 recap and some of this so far, and even the mid-year budget adjustments, the topic is workforce, workforce, workforce. Uh, so the board wanted to call out some of these areas here. Uh, and looking at specifically the vacancy rate of primary care MDs, especially MDs, uh, nurses, nursing support, and all other, trying to get some of those levels. We saw some of that in Rutland's mid-year request, uh, which is a, a pretty solid showing of the impact of vacancy, current vacancy rates on an organization. So being able to see a little bit more of that. Uh, looking at the average turnover rates for primary care MD, especially MD, RN, nursing support, and all other, from fiscal year 18 to 21 to capture uh, some of that average turnover, looking at uh, the years pre and during the pandemic uh, to assess for uh, potential impact and increase of, of those turnover rates. Uh, report on initiatives and funding sources to reduce workforce pressures through recruitment and retainment. And please comment on and quantify the impact of nursing and MD travelers on your budget request. And backing up a little bit on letter C, uh, there are certain bills moving through the legislature right now that would provide some grant funding 
to allow hospitals and other healthcare workforce uh, providers to access funding to help uh, retain and recruit. And so uh, that could be several sources uh, from what we understand and trying to understand what hospitals are doing to seek out and attain some of those funding sources to help ease the burden that we all know too well uh, of their experience in the current environment. <clears throat> And finally, uh, moving in for the last piece of the guidance document here, moving into section 3H1, uh, supplemental data monitoring was requested of us that we add some patient migration language around this specifically, which links back to the uh, criteria for factors to be considered for review. So the A team has uh, put some language in here. The market share will be defined as percentage of service line charges from local residents within a hospital service area versus non-local residents outside a hospital service area. Market share will be disaggregated by primary payer. You can see the patient origin dashboard, patient origin by hospital tab, for example. Uh, so we've uh, had the A team build that language out. And finally, <clears throat> uh, we altered the uh, inflation table example to help uh, serve as a point of reference for hospitals to populate the table above accurately. Uh, and because inflation is becoming such a major topic, is we're going to have to watch. Uh, the submissions this year to make sure that they are uh, accurate and can inform the board appropriately. Uh, so hospitals will fill out their um, <clears throat> inflation table here. This column E here should be the category percentage of the total operating expense budget. So uh, our hypothetical example here is that medical staff contribute 40% to the total operating budget example. The increase there is 3%. Hospital will provide the dollar amount for that 3%, and then the weighted average will uh, calculate based on the input from here, and it will sum itself up down here in the bottom line. So those are the changes that uh, we captured from the board request last week. Uh, one last other one, I'll turn here over to Russ McCracken as it relates to the budget and amendment adjustment policy. So, Russ, I'll turn it over to you to chat through uh, this document here that was sent out to the board and stakeholders along with the other documents. Um, sure, Patrick, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I don't really have any changes to it from um, what I described in the meeting last week, um, which highlighted the additional piece here that uh, you can see on the screen that for any um, to add an additional step in the hospital amendment, the hospitals are requesting a mid year amendment that if they're requesting an additional rate increase, it has to notify um, the applicable commercial insurer of the requested increase before the board takes action on it. Um, going through the, the current mid year budget requests, um, this seemed like a, a valuable step to add to that process um, to help the board's deliberation. Uh, I do also want to flag, um, Patrick, if you could scroll up on this document just a little bit. Um, the HCA noted a, a couple of, uh, requested a couple of comments or changes uh, under the, yeah, right there. Um, the board has had, um, a policy uh, regarding provider transfers, which um, came out of uh, session law from 2016. Uh, the HCA requested that we update this section um, to specify that the notice to patients is um, written in plain language and also offers a, a phone number along with the contact information. Um, Neither of those seemed uh, um, to be, you know, objectionable to us at all. So uh, they're not. I, I realize they're not updated in this version, but that that's a, I think, a small change we would make. Thank you, Russ. <clears throat> so to recap here. Um, the staff recommendation around MPR currently stands at 6.1%, as we discussed last week. The recommendation around uh, 
setting an average change in charge ceiling um, is is still on. Oops, sorry, is still not something we would recommend. Um, continued elimination of the budget hearing uh, exemption recommend. Uh, sorry, elimination of budget hearing exemptions is still under the recommendation. Uh, also, inclusion of added factors for review as amendment. Uh, uh, as of today, 323, and I'm just recapping some of the changes you've seen here throughout the guidance. So when I say as amendment, it means as we've uh, highlighted for you here in the last several minutes. Uh, so addition of sustainability planning discussion component to narrative section A as amendment as amended today. Addition of change in charge results questions from FY22 approved rate in the narrative as amended. Uh, addition of health equity questions in section C, so that is as amended with the definition. <clears throat> uh, the addition of reimagined value based care participation questions, that is as of last week, no changes there. Addition of supplemental data monitoring pilot as amended with the language around the uh, patient migration. The continued affirmative of quality component related to VPQHC, which is still as of last week. Uh, update to the budget amendment adjustment policy as amended as of today. Uh, obviously, Russ has just suggested a couple of additional changes, so likely to amend that again for next week. Uh, and then the recommended other language changes on, that we've already covered here on slides six and seven. And finally, uh, we recommend no vote until uh, the board has had time to consider the contributions from the HCA, uh, which is in line with our presentation from last week. So that brings us to the end of our discussion here and looking forward uh, as we talked at the beginning here, uh, the March 30th meeting next week to do a final review of the guidance with everything considered uh, and the final vote. And once that is concluded, we will send out the guidance on March 31st to the hospitals and that will take us to July 1st for budget submissions, uh, appendices and other materials as requested by the board and staff. And uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And again, uh, just to reiterate, uh, um, we won't be taking a vote today, but it will be scheduled for next Wednesday. And um, hopefully we'll have all our answers by then and be able to move forward. But I wanted to start off the questioning um, today with a question for Russ McCracken because a couple of uh, board members last week um, made the argument that there really shouldn't be a number for NPR and the guidance based on the fact that each of the 14 hospitals um, has been affected by the pandemic differently and they're each in a different um, situation and they each have their own story to tell. And Russ, you were asked to go back and look at um, legislation that allows for some um, loosening in the regulations because of the pandemic and I was hopeful that you could give us a report back on your findings. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, the um, legislation that you're referring to specifically is uh, Bill H-654. Um, it was passed and sent to the governor earlier this month. I believe the governor signed that uh, actually yesterday. Um, it largely follows the COVID emergency authority that the board was given um, previously during the pandemic and then subsequently lapsed. This bill largely reinstates it. It provides the board with the authority to waive or permit variances from state law guidance and standards uh, that would include the board's hospital budget review statute and rule um, as necessary to maximize direct patient care, safeguard the stability of healthcare providers, and allow for ordinary regulatory processes that are responsive to the evolving needs of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the discussion that was had and that um, reporting back to the board on is that, you know, in my view, the board could use the authority under H-654 um, not to set an NPRFPP uh, growth cap um, as the board has historically done, and um, I think if the board wanted to go that direction, H-654 uh, provides the flexibility to um, permit that under the under the board's uh, hospital budget rule. Thank you, Russ. Questions or comments from board members? 
I have some questions related to the HCA recommendations. I don't know if you want to take those now or if you were specifically wanting questions for Russ. Oh, no. Um, any questions about guidance for Patrick or Russ? OK, um, so and I realize uh, folks haven't had, you know, that we are we did just get the suggestions so people may not be able to answer these, but I thought I would ask my questions to start and they they may actually be more appropriate for the HCA, but I'm just going to put them out there and go from there. So um, I have in the past appreciated the uh, question related to reimbursement ratios relative to Medicare, understanding that not all hospitals um, can necessarily answer that question um, in the same way uh, as a way of assessing uh, quote unquote base reimbursement, if you will. What I'm wondering is that whether given the additional data request, and actually it is on Patrick's screen up right now on the left, related to the reimbursement analysis, which will give us um, similar information, I believe, uh, only perhaps in a more nuanced way, whether that question is, is redundant, uh, helpful as an addition. I just wanted a little bit of discussion about that or thinking about that. Um, so they, basically, I, Robin, I, I hear your question and I think uh, we could give Patrick a stab at it or we could turn it over to Mike Fisher. Patrick, how do you wish to proceed? If we have a member of our analytics team on, I would uh, defer to them, but I'm guessing they haven't seen uh, what Robin's talking about, so I'm not sure we would have any feedback today. So let's go directly to the healthcare advocate, Mike. <clears throat> Um, Robin, good question. I'm not going to be able to answer you fully at this moment, but but do want to just uh, recognize that that um, what our interest here is that we have some confidence that uh, all hospitals or as many hospitals as possible are calculating this in the same way. Um, and so, um, you know, I would look, I'd be interested in your staff's um, analysis of that, whether this question gets us there. OK, that sounds good. I'm happy to I just was curious because I, I I think in my mind, both what you're asking and and the question in the guidance are trying to get at the same thing. So I just want to make sure that if we're getting what we need in one place, we're not asking for for it twice, essentially in different forms. Um, on let me just pull up, switch my screen here for a minute and. The the other question I had um, related to the HCA questions. Hold on just one second. Oh, um, there is a question. Let me see if I can find it now. Um, around the charge request where the HCA recommended asking each hospital to provide a high level contingency plan or how it would amend its business strategy. Um, I'm interested in that question and the answers. I'm wondering if it would be uh, a better way to get at the information would be for it to be a hearing question, just because I think that um, a written document may not, may be kind of cumbersome to produce and may not really get at the level of detail or information that we're looking for. So I'll just throw that out there as a, um, would it make more sense to ask that to be discussed as part of the hearing rather than a written document? Um, and those are my two uh, questions or things I wanted to throw out on the HCA inputs. Um, and then related to Vaz's suggestions, um, I wanted to say that I very much appreciated their comments related to the in reform environment. Um, I would, uh, I'm wondering if not in relationship to the guidance, but in a different uh, type of meeting, if it would make sense at some point in the future to have that discussion 
around some of the risk issues that they raised uh, in a more forward looking way, both as part or connected with hospital sustainability and all pair model planning. So that's really more a comment for our uh, for Sarah Kinsler's team and Patrick's team to think about moving forward in terms of how we could start having that discussion um, related to reform. Um, also, I was thinking we should probably share those comments with AHS. Um, I would be interested in having a discussion about the NPR target. Um, I I'm have to say I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea of eliminating the target, not because I think that it can. Well, I guess I should say because I don't think it actually constrains um, the hospitals from asking what they need. I think we saw that last year when uh, most of the hospitals exceeded the target in their request. Uh, certainly there are, you know, it makes it perhaps a little more confusing for public comparisons, but uh, we always, I believe, look at the hospital's individual circumstances and the purpose of setting a target is to really set a directional uh, goal for the state um, and not that each hospital would be bound to it. Uh, and certainly I think we've shown in the past that that we haven't bound them to it when it didn't make sense for their circumstances. Um, so I'd like to have more discussion about that. I think for me to get comfortable, I would need to have us think through like what are the other metrics we're going to uh, look at uh, when we're approving NPR and those could include um, around the price pieces, um, you know, inflation certainly and extraordinary workforce pressures. But I think also NPR is a measure of overall growth. So what are the other measures of overall growth that we potentially could look at um, in making that decision? So, and I don't, you know, I have some ideas, but I wouldn't say that I'm the expert here. So I would throw that out as a point of discussion and thinking for others. Um, in Vaz's comment, they also indicated had mentioned workforce, which I felt like was uh, addressed in terms of uh, including uh, extraordinary workforce costs in the at least the version that Patrick just um, presented. So I'll just say for myself, I felt like that was addressed, but if uh, others don't believe so, I'm interested in hearing about that. Um, in terms of wait times, I, I I don't have, I I don't feel like I have a good idea of the right way to do that. So I'm interested to hear what other people think. So uh, I certainly think it's important to consider it given the attention that has been um, and the issues in that area, but the right way to do it, I'm open in terms of how to move forward with that. Um, and I think that, and I on the, and then the last comment I would wanna just sort of respond to from Vaz's public comment is around the ACO and supplemental data. You know, one of the areas that Vaz has been talking to us about is aligning our regulatory processes. And I think that these sections are important for uh, that alignment. And in I certainly recognize that uh, the new data components are a new part that will take time for hospitals, but I do think it's also a forward looking part of ways that we need to think about how to refine our process. So um, I would be open to maybe thinking about doing that as a pilot where not every single hospital responds, um, but I, we lose something there as well because different hospitals will respond differently and will have different issues. So, um, so I just wanted to kind of throw those thoughts out there for um, other board members to react to. Thank you, Robin. Other comments or questions from board members? I have a, a couple. Um, one is I, you know, uh, relative to the target, I, um, I'm not quite sure that 
not having a target works, um, uh, you know, as the VAS letter recommends. Um, but I also understand that a one year target um, could be viewed, especially in this volatile period, could be viewed as a bit of a straitjacket. And so I'm just wondering, just for other folks to think about, um, if we did something like a two year target and we said, um, let's, you know, our, let's pick a growth rate, four and a half percent, apply that, you know, a little more generous than the one we have now, given the circumstances, apply that for two years. That'd be a, a, a cumulative 9%, forget about the compounding for a minute, but a cumulative 9% a growth rate over a two year period. And then let the hospitals decide how much of that they're going to apply in 2023 and how much of it they're going to apply in 2024 and build their budgets around that. Um, it says, so oh, I think then, you know, an approach, I mean, one year is a short period of time. Two years is probably not long enough of a period of time, but it's better than one one year. And to give put hospitals in the position of thinking down the road a couple of years that, gee, you know, we have nine percent, uh, we have a nine percent increase to consider. Let's put six of it in 2023 and three of it in in um, uh, 2024. Make some match to, to suit their circumstances because there are all these. Um, personalities out there in terms of hospitals and they do and 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 they you know trying to kind of focus them in a one year period on a, a single number uh it isn't a, a very flexible process so that's so Tom one can I just jump in there in that um I would uh, ask legal to uh, weigh in because we've had this discussion in the past about having um two year targets and at the time and Maybe I have this wrong, but uh, Mike, I think you were here back then. Um, wasn't it the interpretation that the statutory language specifically referred to a yearly budget and that it um, was inappropriate for us to have a multi-year target? Or do I have this completely wrong? Well, well let, let, let me be clear. It wouldn't be a two-year budget process. We would do you know, it, we, we would do a 2023 process and 2024 process in the next year. But in the 2023 process, we would be focused up upon an allocation of the of the um, cumulative target amount in 2023. I also think actually that that language that Russ uh, um, um, presented earlier would probably mitigate any 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 uh, legalistic path toward this. I just I'm just trying to find a a better place for hospitals to have more breathing room, um, but for us to also have some guardrails around the process that are that that uh, uh, keep overall growth um, uh, at, at 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 a measured rate. But it's, I'm not I'm not advocating. For a two year budget process. Mike, any words of wisdom? Um, trying to remember that conversation, but uh, the. The statute says that you the board will establish a budget. Uh, for each hospital annually, um, but what Tom is talking about is setting. Um, guidance into the future beyond one year, which is not, you know, that's a different. Different issue. Um, I don't think you could lock yourself into. Uh, um, like, I think if you wanted to set guidance for two years, I think that. Makes sense and you could do that. Um, you could obviously change what that second year is if you needed to, but um, I think you can set the expectation for two years, but I'll let Russ weigh in if he feels differently about that. No, I, I agree with what Mike said. Um, the, and I'll just go on to add that the, uh, kind of, we'll call it the COVID um, 
emergency continuation of the COVID emergency authority uh, that gives the board some authority to waive statute and rules um, extends through March 31st, 2023. Uh, so it goes through the guidance, but not the budget process, not the whole budget process for next year. But it seems like there's a way, Tom, so it can be explored. Well, I, you know, I'd like to hear from Boz about it. I, you know, if if I, I, I just, I just think if I was in their position, I would like the, the flexibility. I'd appreciate the constraint, but it just gives them more breathing room to uh, bring um, this pandemic or endemic, hopefully, you know, in, into a soft landing. The the other area that I just want to ask Patrick about is one of the um, results or inf you know that that you learn from a bu each budget process um, kind of sticks with you. And the one that has stuck with me is the fact that in terms of commercial payments, a plus or minus one percent of them are structured as fixed perspective payments. And so, and and I don't think that we can be successful with healthcare reform if we have that major payer out there, you know, not participating, you know, in 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 the infrastructure of reform. And fixed perspective payments uh, is one of those key uh, pillars in the infrastructure. So, where in this guidance, um, you know, might one find? a path to use the 2023 budget process as a way to uh, move the ball down the court. I mean, we've got the ACO with their chart um, and and they have, um, uh, the, it was called condition 18, they kind of laid out a path. Um, and is there, and trying to kind of integrate, uh, um, you know, the, the, the the, the budget process with the uh, carrier rate setting process to 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 get to get the the carriers and the hospitals you know closer together. I mean, you may recall this, you know, where the carriers are saying they can't find any will, willing partners, you know, and and Dr. Brumstead saying, you know, give me a population based actuarial sound, you know, fixed perspective payment with the private carriers, and he'd be first in line. So there's this gap. Um, and I just think that we need to find a path sooner rather than later to um, to get hospitals participating um, in with fixed perspective payments um, with uh, with hospitals. So you won't find it here. Uh, you won't find it here for all of the reasons you just mentioned and that you can't put the cart before the horse until those plans are in place and the hospitals can build their budgets to meet them then it's not going to be it can't be part of this process because it'll just not meet the the expectation so you're not going to see it here hospitals are already building their budgets and those plans to my my knowledge don't yet exist and so until they do we can't build a guidance to fit that that need or that expectation there's got to be work in other areas first before we can begin to build our regulatory approach to meet that. It's like we wouldn't have budgeted in, uh, we wouldn't have built FPP into this before any of that got going uh, until it's set in stone and we could begin to move and there are agreements in place. There's not much use in trying to build something into a budget process uh, where expectations can't be met or, or measured for that matter. Well, I just worry then, I mean, we have moved uh, uh, you know, down the road with uh, Medicaid um, and we have moved down the road with Medicare and hopefully we'll move further down the road. Um, but to have commercial out there, which is one of the largest parts of the pie kind of stalled, um, I think um, unfortunately might jeopardize our overall reform effort. And uh, um, so, you know, wh wh whether, I, and I don't think the board is in a position to write the plan. I think this has to be a collaborative effort between carriers and hospitals, and uh, you know, we've had one good hospital, Southwestern, which you know has a pretty good proven track record with the FPP that they're working with. And um, I'm, I, I, you know, 
I'm just kind of looking for a way for these guidelines to um, have us all stop talking about it and do something about it. But those are my two thoughts. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to think maybe a, a little more thinking around budget orders uh, could be the place for that instead of the budget guidance, um, because we're looking so far forward here. Um, things have to be better aligned and that infrastructure has to be built out. So as that infrastructure comes online, uh, perhaps there's an opportunity to build it into budget orders that will set the stage for hospitals so they can expect it um, as they move into their fiscal year that, hey, next year in the budget guidance, you can expect uh, 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 some new regulatory components that relate to um, commercial FPP space. Well, that's approach. We would just have to mirror that on the rate setting side so that we're, we're pushing the, the, the two of them closer together. Thank you, Patrick. Other board members, questions or, or comments? I can hop up. Um, so first of all, you know, to the hospital budget team, thank you for all the hard work between last week and this week, and uh, appreciate your incorporating a lot of the suggestions we've made. Um, I have to think more about Tom's suggestion, um, hearing it now for the first time, but I guess my, my gut reaction is setting a target for this year is hard enough. I'm not sure how we would set a meaningful two-year target given all the volatility and uncertainty that we're already swimming in. Uh, so for me, at least at the moment, and I know we're still talking about this next week, but uh, given that tremendous uncertainty and the fact that every hospital is in a pretty unique uh, position as we're emerging from this pretty highly disruptive pandemic, I, I'm just still not comfortable setting a meaningful one-size-fits-all NPR FPP growth cap for this year. So at this point, my preference is still, I could be Maybe my mind could be changed based on Tom's suggestion, but uh, I would have to really understand what that growth, two-year growth target was based on. Um, I'd have to ground it in some data, some some evidence, something. Um, so for now, my my preference is to use this COVID emergency authority that's outlined in H654 to, to waive that GMCB rule and standard practice of setting a target. I think if we use our authority to evaluate each hospital's budget submission on a case-by-case -case basis, I think we're, we're gonna be better off. Um, even though I recognize to Robin's point that we do that anyway, um, I do think that in the past, some hospitals have used our growth target, set their NPR to that growth target aspirationally and set their expenses aspirationally and then been in trouble. So I think I would like to see us actually rely this year, given that we have some expanded latitude, um, to rely less on budget to budget evaluations and instead review each submitted budget in relation to their actuals for 19, 20, and 21 and their projections for what they're seeing in 22. I think if we don't set that growth target, it'll be really important for us then to understand each of the assumptions the hospital is making about projected inflation and projected utilization change for fiscal year 23 relative to fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 projected. So we really are going to have to hone in on understanding what exactly those projections are based on. I think the inflation table that we use in the that we have in the guidance will give us a good indication of their assumptions about expected price growth. Um, and we can see if, you know, we can compare, you know, that those expectations to other benchmarks um, nationally about what you know expected inflation might be and see how they line up um, to what they're submitting. But I also think we're going to need a clear understanding of their assumptions about fiscal year 23 utilization. Again, like I said, relative to fiscal year 21 and 22, I think for some hospitals, we may see utilization growth, right, in 23 over 22 and 21, if, particularly if they're in areas of population growth. But I also suspect we may see some utilization decline to the extent that pent-up demand has been met or COVID-related hospitalizations decline. Rutland is already seeing utilization fall off, right? So I think we want to see what, are the, what does the utilization look like and what makes sense for their projections. Um, so I think it's going to be important if we do waive the NPR cap to make sure that the hospital submissions clearly outline their utilization assumptions for both inpatient and outpatient care. Um, so that's where I that's where I'm landing on NPR FPP right now. Uh, I just want to also say, you know, 
I really appreciated all those changes, Patrick, that you and the team went through. I have a couple of small minor adjustments, if you don't mind me going through them. They're really quick, I hope. Um, on page eight, with respect to the FTE per adjusted occupied bed, the occupancy rate, and the average daily census, I'm actually reflecting back on some conversations we had with BRG and the hospital sustainability analysis, where there was some um, concerns about the occupancy rate per staffed bed versus per licensed bed. Uh, so I actually think both are interesting and important. As uh, and so I would actually suggest that we ask for occupancy rate per staff bed and ask for it separately from per licensed bed. So we're getting both pieces of information. Uh, under the charge request under part three, I think there was just a minor typo there. I think impacted should be impact. It's just in my notes, but I'll share that. Uh, under wait times, um, I, I welcome the conversation around how we measure wait times. I was just thinking about adding a part three to that. It occurred to me this morning that basically says specifically, please outline steps taken to reduce referral and visit lag times in practices where the majority of patients are not scheduled within two days of referral or not seen within two weeks of scheduling. Something like that, like talk about, asking them to talk about the steps they're taking to reduce those wait times, I think is an important component of the wait time section. Um, and then in terms of the workforce challenges, you know, we're, we just heard a presentation, we're hearing about these workforce challenges. So I really like the addition to that section. And I think as I was reflecting a little bit more this morning, I think we need a, a deeper understanding of those labor costs. And I noticed, I went back and looked at um, the flex monitoring report, and there are two measures in there that are uh, maybe worth tracking uh, to understand those labor costs. One is salaries over NPR. And the second is average salary per FTE. And I think those are those are helpful. Certainly in the for the critical access hospitals, we'll have some benchmarks that we can compare it to, and we'll really be able to understand those labor costs and how they're unfolding over time. And I thought it was interesting in the the monitoring report that I saw, the critical access hospitals in Vermont are actually above average on both of those measures. So we might want to dig into that and understand a little bit more why. And then finally, um, just in reference to um, Robin's question about the percent of Medicare, I just want to throw out there that, uh, interestingly, if, if you all remember, Rand had done the study tracking hospitals and the percentage of uh, reimbursements uh, as a percentage of Medicare. And at the time, um, Rand did not have our all-payer claims database data in there. They were using New Hampshire's data, so it wasn't really an accurate reflection probably of the percent uh, of Medicare. I did reach out a few weeks ago just to find out from RAND. They, we've given them vCures, so they now have vCures, and they are doing an updated study, which is actually they're anticipating a mid-May release of that, which should have all of our hospitals in it. So this is you know this is information from a few weeks ago i think it might be telling and interesting and so i don't know if that might also be worth having the data team just look into and as they're answering robin's question about whether that data might also become available through the rand report so that's all i have thank you very much to the team for all the hard work here thanks jess other comments or questions from the board Jess, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm wondering if you could speak to collecting the wait times data versus using the pri the report from AHS. And and again, I don't want to put you on the spot, so if you want to think about that and talk about it next week, that's fine. I, that would just be helpful for me to understand sort of the pros and cons of those two approaches. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of issues. I think the, the most... Um, some of the data that was in the report that um, was, you know, come from came from the secret shopper exercise, right, where all of the practices were called and, and that was a, a point in time estimate. And some of the pushback that was received was this was at the, at the peak of uh, COVID and it may not reflect what's actually happening um, on the ground. We also collected some third next appointment data. It didn't match uh, in real time, third next available appointment. It didn't match in real time what was happening in the secret shopper exercise. Um, and so that, you know, validated what we'd heard from other sources that third next available appointment is not particularly useful or, or reflective of the patient experience. And I think um, there's been no data 
out there that we've ever collected or seen on the um, referral lag. And the referral lag is, is real. <laughs> I'm experiencing one right now. And, um, and so I think having that, that's a new measure that we don't have that is not, has, was not collected as part of the wait times. And so also to me, cognizant of the data that was probably the most uh, current data came from that secret shopper exercise in the middle of, you know, the COVID pent up or, you know, uh, pandemic. I think asking the hospitals for that data in as of July is going to be much more current and hopefully post pandemic and maybe more reflective of the experience going forward. So those are my quick answers to that. But I can think about it a bit more. Thank you. Other comments or questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to public comment and I'll rec recognize healthcare advocate Mike Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I put my hand down. Um, so uh, just very briefly, uh, I appreciate the question and the discussion about Medicare benchmark approaches. Um, and um, uh, we will also engage in taking a look at the um, reimbursement analysis question and, and our question and um, and also happy to talk with staff about uh, the various approaches and see if we can find a way to bring them all together. And then uh, also, um, Member Lunge, I think uh, there's pros and cons to the contingency question is in a written form or in the hearing. Um, and so I, I'm agreeable uh, to any approach. I just think it'd be useful to hear from hospitals uh, how they uh, will, will manage the scenario where they don't get everything they ask for. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Mike. Chair, and also thank you, board, and, and thank you, board staff, for your hard work on this. Thanks, Mike. Next, I'm going to go to Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the dialogue today and the hard work of the budget team, as always, um, and the attention, especially from board member Robin Lunge to the letter we took a lot of time to write and which we sent yesterday articulating our our concerns and recommendations for the guidance and as always hope you take those points into serious consideration as you finalize it. Um, you know, as I've said in this forum um, many, many times, I think the budget process should focus most on making sure hospitals have the resources required to meet patient need and be stable financially and focus less on mandates that may involve a lot of analytical and reporting work especially for small strained hospitals, but deliver little value to the budget process. Um, and I know you heard this as recently as a couple hours ago from Claudio Fort. Our hospitals continue to emerge from the pandemic and pick their heads up from rapid response and crisis management that has been going on for two plus years. It was, it was really only a few weeks ago that we had just a few ICU beds available across the state of Vermont. And recovery from all that is, is no small or no immediate task. Um, hospitals have lost workers, their staffs are exhausted and depleted, their operations have changed, as have their uh, procedures and policies and infection control measures, and obviously their finances and cost structures have been radically affected too. So whether it is managing the regulatory requirements or moving to a new health reform model, hospitals don't have extra bandwidth right now. Um, also just want to say, um, given the chance here, that Hospitals care deeply about how affordable health care is. They think about it when they participate in the ACO and work to move towards value-based care. They think about it when they continue to find ways to cut expenses, even as those options become increasingly limited. And, and they think about it when they build their budgets and attempt as best they can to balance the priority of meeting community need with their prices. You know, we are a uniquely nonprofit system in Vermont, and the incentive is to deliver the best possible care to the people we serve and to keep our communities healthy. Um, so with that, just a few thoughts on wait times. Um, uh, you know, I refer you to the letter, obviously, but this is a complicated space as today's dialogue demonstrates and, and as is illustrated by the 100 plus page report that was already produced by the Agency of Human Services. And um, as Robin and others have pointed out, there are significant challenges with identifying and collecting the right data, which may be one reason that no other state I've been able to find has done this or requires this information from hospitals. Just to name one of the challenges, it is really important to know about clinical appropriateness, whether any metric that is selected 
correctly or or completely sort of um, identifies or captures how urgent or important the wait time is for a given appointment. Many appointments may not be time sensitive or at least not as time sensitive as truly urgent appointments, which can be and usually are booked much more quickly. Um, we also need to really understand the, the variable burden this kind of request can create for different types of hospitals with different EMRs and systems and staff sizes. Um, as we said in our letter, and again, as I think this conversation today makes all too clear, sorting this out and coming up with the right measurement is not something we can do within the timeline of budget guidance. It requires more time and more thought and conversation to find the right way to do this across our hospital field with minimal burden and maximum benefit, if that's even possible. So I think it does make more sense to work on that in coming weeks and months and not impose a new mandate right now until those details and nuances can be sort of figured out and managed. Um, and I would just lastly say, Mr. Chair, that um, given the dialogue today and this sort of constantly evolving conversation around guidance, um, if, if there are other changes, um, you know, we may, we may comment further, but really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to do so today. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Jeff. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? OK, we'll come back to this next Wednesday. Hopefully we'll be able to finalize it, but. Um, and again, um, Susan, the public comment period is open till when Monday. That's correct. March 28th. Thank you. So the, the quicker any comments come to us, the uh, better chance we have to uh, digest them and be prepared to start making some decisions next Wednesday. So is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.